That means you are joined. What about this? BM BM Shane Bunky BM Shane Chet Hi, Graham. Right. Okay, now. Okay, now. Hi, Graham. Yeah, that's fine. If you want to turn your microphone back off, it looks like someone's trying to organize some presentations. Oh, nice okay. to see you. Sorry, yep. sorry it's, a bit it, it, it's a bit stressful, but we're in. Yes, yes, I was a bit worried. I, I was just finishing up. We just finished dinner. You've just finished breakfast. Very good. Right. Yes. We've got 60 people online. Should be good. 60. Enjoy it. We've yep. got a lot more to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll come on over the next uh, five minutes. Five, ten minutes. Yeah, should be good. Sure. Looking forward to it. I hope it goes well yes. for you. Oh, uh, well, my, my bit's pretty saying the obvious to you, but still. Yeah. Well, people will want to hear what we're saying. Right. Yeah. Talk to you shortly. Cheers. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll let you talk to Danish. Okay, thanks. Right. Is John Ockenden Lee listening? I have no idea. I don't know. I told him about it. He may come on. Um, <coughs> he, may, he may be on the on the YouTube line. So we'll see yeah, how that works. That'll be John, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, well it'd be Hillary. <laughs> Yes. Right. Okay. So looks like everyone's showing up. Okay. So, do you want to turn? Do you want to turn your mic off, uh, Graham? Because you'll be talking to everybody at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Can you? Can you thank yes. you. Again.
This Google Meet, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'll keep this screen on, right? Yeah. So I have to start. So should I switch? Keep this on. I mean, keep this. Dr. Ashley Hutchinson, Deputy Director, Center of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, University of Witwatersand, Johannesburg, South Africa. Professor Colin Please, Professor of Applied Mathematics, University of Oxford. Professor Paul Horth, Department of Applied Mathematics and Computer Science, Technical University of Denmark. Professor Will Childers, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, Netherlands. The coordinators for this webinar are Professor Dhanesh Patel, Director of Office of International Affairs, Maharaja Sayajira University, and Professor Colin Please from the University of Oxford. I also welcome Professor Arun Pratap, Dean, Faculty of Technology and Engineering, Professor H.R. Kataria, Dean, Faculty of Science, Dr. B. M. Shah, Head, Department of Applied Mathematics, Professor R.G. Vyas, Head, Deply Department of Mathematics. Professor Vipul Kalamkar, Head, Department of Statistics of the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, and all others from the various parts of the world who have joined this webinar. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Parimal Vyas, Professor Parimal Vyas has effectively steered the Maharaja Sayajirao University since 2016. Apart from being an academician of international repute, Sir is an able leader and a true visionary. He has a long-term vision for our university and I quote, my wish is to ensure that the Maharaja Sayajirao University serves in the future as a key employer, technology provider, and a source of knowledge and skills in the region." Unquote. Under his leadership, the university has scaled new heights and reached new corners. In the current COVID-19 pandemic crisis, Sir has been exemplary in his humanitarian efforts and gestures and has- Council uh, Bengaluru. I'm very happy to share with all of you that our to the family of around 1500 uh, you know teachers and uh, we have 
some of the promising faculties like faculty of technology and engineering faculty of science uh, we have a very strategic emphasis on liberal arts with faculty of uh, arts we have faculty of family and community science faculty of management studies social work we have uh, also uh, you know three colleges we have polytechnic college uh, and uh, very happy to share with you that uh, you would not come across you know these kind of a setup we have a faculty of science where we have department of mathematics we have department of statistics we have department of chemistry but when you go to the faculty of technology we have a, what we call it as a, a department of applied chemistry department of applied mathematics and department of applied uh, physics so this is very interesting uh, when we talk about pure research and applied research and the nice integration of that which has to happen department of applied mathematics which is a which is a, one of the participant of these uh, important webinar which we are hosting i'm very happy to learn that uh, uh, more than 30 plus countries uh, attendees they are uh, participating in this webinar and uh, i believe we can't think of a life without mathematics 24 into 7 anything and everything that we do we compute we calculate and then uh, we try to you know put into practice we would not be able to think anything logically and it's it's a matter of great pride for me the reason being because you know the contribution of india in mathematics is immense you know aryabhata uh, you know who provided us uh, the contribution in the field of mathematics this is one of the very leading department uh, at the same time professor dhanesh patel who is a former head department of applied mathematics we have entrusted him the responsibility of managing uh, the internationalization of uh, you know higher education and uh, i'm very happy to share with you that we have overseas students of more, for from more than 14 countries and then they are all in the campus and uh, understanding of mathematics is very well we need the uh, internet so that more than we need medical training we need computer education we need weather predictions I, i believe whatever uh, quality of life that we enjoy nowadays i i believe uh, earlier you know during my childhood days uh, you know people they were not in a they were not ready to rely on some of the forecasts which are taking place but today i believe now that has become an integral part of our life this is just one example i believe uh, we, we can predict lot many things uh, you know with the help of mathematics one very important challenge i believe which i, I believe where the indians played a big role when we were moving to this new 21st century a shift from 20 to 21st century so it's it's a, it's a matter of a, a great pleasure and i'll tell you what i what we're looking for it is not just, it is not just webinar and just uh, you know uh, sharing of experiences on the contemporary issues challenges on mathematics what we are looking forward from all the esteem uh, academia from different parts of the world they are here in the near future if we really want to improve the quality of higher education what we really need to do we really need to do and promote collaborative research i would like to share with you that uh, the department of applied mathematics uh, or department of applied chemistry or applied physics we have a very close connect with the industry we get a lot of live problems from the industry and scholars uh, who are pursuing the research and postgraduate students they are given these assignments to deal with those problems they deal with this they try to attempt to uh, you know come out with some solutions of these uh, live problems that is what we do so i wish uh, all of you all the very best on behalf of the university i welcome each one of you all the attendees and all the distinguished speakers and uh, it would be a matter of pleasure for us to host you because we are passing through this uh, uh, critical time right now but um, at, at the ms university of baroda we host uh, and that that's a long tradition that we host so many distinguished uh, you know Uh, professors across the world so i invite all of you when the situation becomes normal when we are back to normal of course it will be a new normal 
and uh, the challenges are many fold uh, you know to all of us as an educationist as a researcher but um, it, it would be pleasure for us to host you to be, i invite you to visit our campus and uh, last but not the least i appreciate your support to our university and wish that uh, this is just a beginning in the near future we would look forward for you know extending many collaborations maybe in terms of teaching research foreign exchange and such other projects i believe that can happen with the maharaja sahajira university of baroda uh, my best wishes to all of you and uh, thank you very much for a very very patient listening thank you thank you one and all thank you very much sir for such encouraging words uh, for the next part of the session we have a talk by professor graham wake and uh, i hand over the session to the webinar moderator professor paul horth professor horth yes good morning from copenhagen i hope you are all well and you can hear me so it's an it's an honor for me to uh, introduce professor graham wake Professor Wake is uh, emeritus professor uh, of industrial mathematics and a research fellow at Massey University and uh, director of the consulting company Wake Science. He has been instrumental in focusing applied mathematics on issues of relevance to New Zealand, particularly in modeling biological systems in agriculture, in health, and medical industrial uh, sectors. Professor Wake has significantly advanced teaching and applications of mathematics in New Zealand. His enthusiasm and energy has inspired numerous research students and collaborators. He has founded and until recently directed the Mathematics and Industry Study Group and is a founding member and former twice president and fellow of the New Zealand Mathematical Society. He was the first New Zealander to be both elected president of Australian and New Zealand in Industrial Applied Mathematics. He was awarded the prestigious uh, Anzium Medal in 2006. He's a founding member of the Asian Pacific Consortium for Mathematics and Industry. And that will be the subject of his talk today. It is entitled Initiatives in the Asia Pacific region for fostering mathematics and industry from a New Zealand perspective. Professor Wake. Hello, I'm Graham Wake. Um, welcome to New Zealand. I, we are late mid, mid evening here, so um, we've got an advantage over you um, in terms of time. Ready to, I will begin my presentation then. Okay, well, thank you. You've already heard my title, and it's a pleasure to be here, um, metaphorically here. Um, I sorry we can't be with you um, and um, thank the hosts very much for having us at Baruda um, and I look forward to meeting you all at some of the meetings. Okay. Well, I thought I should set the scene a little bit um, because of my longevity in this game, someone like 52 years ago. Um, I thought we, thought we should um, uh, make make some f features about mathematics that we all know: longevity, open-endedness, abstraction, and universality. But I'm very taken with the fifth point, um, which I got from Michael Gromov, who I heard talk about this. We shall need a new breed of mathematical professionals to make the cross-fertilization of um, ideas crucial and it will be for the health of the science and the survival they insert as mine survival of mathematics but we do we know what industry needs how do we find out and how do we provide it is what this talk is all about I just remind you of our geography here we are 
right on the date line, hence at nearly half past seven at night. Um, and the region of that part of the world is the kind of area that I've encompassed in my 52 years of doing this. Firstly, in Australia, um, very active relationship between New Zealand and Australia in this business. We'll come back to that. Um, I've been very active in helping uh, working with the people in Japan who are leading the way now in the Asian Pacific region and maths and industry, um, though there are others involved as well. South Korea, I spent eight years going backwards and forwards there, and they're thriving in the business uh, of maths and industry. Brunei was my first incursion into Asia, and they have a number of my ex-students there, but of course it has different um, problems to surmount about organization there. And Malaysia um, is very active and is doing well, led from um, the south of West Malaysia. Um, and I've been working very recently with the people in Thailand, and they are on the verge of starting maths and industry uh, groups. But we are all linked in this area by the um, Asia Pacific Consortium, which I will mention later on, and we share experience and expertise in um, running maths and industry programs. So that's the region I'm encompassing. Um, some recent activities in my country, um, the chairman very kindly mentioned the activities in MINS, um, and that's, of course, um, the lovely four-letter word we use for maths and industry study groups here in New Zealand. That was the one hosted here in Auckland, um, north of New Zealand, um, just last year. We're not going to have one this June because of the pandemic, but uh, we were scheduled to have one in Christchurch in the South Island, um, but that's not going to happen now. It's postponed. There's, um, we're lucky with the Asia Pacific Consortium because uh, we have annual meetings in one of, our, one of the member countries, of which there's quite about 15 now, um, some active, some not. not. Uh, we were privileged after 10 years to host, the, uh, host that forum last year, and I co-chaired that with one of my colleagues, um, and we each country has the pleasure of picking a, a theme that's relevant to its country. And of course, New Zealand couldn't do otherwise than have mathematics for the primary industries and the environment. And it was a very great success uh, with people from all of the member countries and a few from outside attending. But what these uh, groups try to do in their country and i picked this one up from my british experience uh i asked after all at oxford when study groups started in the 1960 late 1960s um as a postdoc and these are the kind of activities that their knowledge uh, transfer network actually foster and the you can read it all for yourself but special interest groups uh include of course study groups like we are on about here well, I, when you're in an interdisciplinary group, industry group, I do a lot of work with industry. Um, and remember, in New Zealand, in that industry includes the primary industries and the environment issues that are to the fore here um, and preserving our rather nice environment. We have to often say what industrial mathematics is all about. And there I've listed a few self-evident points, really. Um, the means by which we can help industry, the important thing of starting with a problem that's posed by industry. So many mathematicians forget that. They tend to make the problem as something that's interesting mathematically. And I try to resist that, and I'm quite happy to be scolded by my somewhat academic colleagues who say, oh, that's interesting, but it's not new, and I shrug my shoulders. Um, and an equal partner with science and engineering, of course. And you've got to engage with industry on their terms, make it meaningful to them. And the, in order to earn money, you have to um, do the problem that's so, uh, that they've stated. Uh, I think the others are, are just um, by the by. But I just think we should think about what image we, pro we project to the community and industry. I spend a lot of time in industry 
gatherings and board meetings and community groups talking about this so i know how they think now the get it, doing this has a great positive spin-off for us uh, as academic mathematicians it certainly establishes better links between industry and academic mathematics and golly it does need it uh, we have a very poor image out there um, in New Zealand if you say you're a rugby player you are very popular at a party but not if you're a mathematician you have a very quiet night <laughs> you but it will enhance the image of mathematics in the community by this kind of activity and most importantly it provides much improved edu university education of potential mathematicians through in particular giving them expanded employment prospects for mathematics graduates fresh research problems for mathematicians and also importantly innovative material for teaching courses and um, you know it, it enriches the curriculum I'm sure and what skills do we need to, en to encourage in our students we need to give them the ability to abstract the mathematics from a situation and use mathematics to inform that uh, that uh, situation and we need all those things the one that I'll just highlight here is better communication skills um, I remember being on one appointments committee where we were interviewing young people for a, a research career and we got them to talk about their mathematics and uh, the student uh, it was an interdisciplinary group of senior people and uh, at the end of the talk uh, he was asked can you explain that bit of maths that you did and he said I could but you won't understand it and that's put he didn't get the job uh, that's uh, that was really quite bad um, and uh, we need to see the organizations able to implement what we do for them we're not good at that either um, in the farming support area where I do a lot of research these days uh, when I imp implement something like uh, a pro program for um, meaningful pasture usage uh, in terms of rotation of stock and so on we did that for the farming industry um, I went spent hours tra traveling in the back of a car of a farm advisor just watching how he talked to the talk to the farmers and it was very instructive even though I'm a farmer's son I felt it was quite good to do that now my recommendations when I move around the region and also in parts of um, North America I have a, often asked to make recommendations about how you go about this and I think I would recommend these four points as the main ones consider including industrial mass among the many options offered start with the program at the master's level um, we tried here in um, Auckland to introduce a master's degree in industrial mathematics it went okay but um, we did have an image problem and had to work hard to actually get the administration to accept it try to establish relationships with industry early with local and regional industries start small and build out and encourage your colleagues and postgraduate students to participate in industrial mathematics workshops um, held nationally as you can see from the map New Zealand's a long way from anywhere but we're great travelers when you're allowed to you're not at the moment but um, I was always in Australia a lot and have Australian cousins anyway so it was quite good to go there but we certainly have quite regular ones now in New Zealand um, I had hoped when I started MINS five years ago that we would do it two, two, twice yearly. Well, we've only got up to one yearly, and it, but we um, liaise very closely with the Australians who have them out of season for us, so that works out well. I'll tell you more about that as we go along. You've got to build people thinking along this line about the path through the mire of the problem and the methodology and the roundabout routes of um, being wrong is the first step to getting it right uh, this diagram self-explanatory I guess but it's the way in which you should be thinking about how you go about maths and industry um, and look at the number of times you rehearse your steps revise gather feedback think about what you've done 
and that's that's a nice little diagram to have i guess this will be put on a web somewhere or and it'll be downloadable anyway now look at the um views of your colleagues if you were asked to explain why this is a good thing you should emphasize at least these three points or four points relevance of expertise to real world applications and you get a lot of satisfaction at least i do from knowledge transfer it's a source of interesting new problems you have a colleague who said i'm a bit sick of doing this bit of maths what what can you suggest a new problem well i think that's great i remember getting into functional differential equations simply because it was a came up in a model of tumor cell growth i work in the medical area sometimes and um, that method that i gave for um, non using functional equations is now part of the literature on that on tumor cell growth i'm pleased about that and most importantly for us semi-retired people there's it's a way of financial gain and um, you know if you want to get grants you can try grants in that area you often get disincentives people think it's the dirty end of science they'll say oh that's not new um, and they forget about the fact that it's useful career structure is usually to do with research and teaching and i would add a third variable like the function of three variables um, consulting so you've got to work through those issues the industry, when I talk to boardrooms and, and business groups and so on, I've done a lot of that over the years, mostly seeking challenges um, for the study groups that I've directed. You get questions like, is mathematics really relevant to industry? Now, that's a foregone conclusion for you and I, but or many of you anyway, um, but they don't know how they can use it. They've never been told, they've never been shown. Now, I know in New Zealand industry is quite small and many of them don't hire mathematicians on their staff, but they want access to expertise and the, and the study groups, one way they can get it. And they'll ask, what benefits can I expect? What are the mechanisms? How much would it cost? Can I have it tomorrow? Um, can I buy it now? Answer by Monday, please, and I'll pay. You know, that sort of questions you get. And they're always worried about, will I understand it? Because they didn't want a lot of equations. They want algorithms maybe, but mostly the computer code and how to use them. And they'll say, why are you bothering anyway? What's in it for you? So that's an interesting, um, you must be prepared to make those kind of answers. So that's my answers roughly. New Zealand Steel, by the way, was one we benefit. We helped a lot. They're now partly owned in Australia, but um, they we have a unique, um, unique steel industry in New Zealand because all our steel is made from iron on iron sands. In other words, and it's stuff from volcanoes that's washed into the sea and comes up on the west coast beaches of not far from where we're living here, and. Um, they have a unique process for making steel out of iron sands and there's not many countries in the world that do this it's the only steel we've got here's things you can do in a given environment from the easy ones to the bigger ones right at the bottom and these are ones that i've experienced at every level um, starting small industry days invite someone in to give a little um, informal chat uh, have theme days. We do a lot of environmental modeling here. We haven't have got much petroleum, but we do a lot of biology in the agricultural area. But you can have theme days. You can have student projects in industry. I had a uh, fortunately had a long visit once in Claremont in Eastern Los Angeles, um, and they had industry actually funding undergraduate projects. And that was an eye-opener to participate in that for a, one semester. And I think that's an idea that we can borrow. Have consulting offices on your campus. Many of you will, of course, but I'm just saying the obvious. The study groups is what we're on about here. And these are ones I've experienced, and in addition to the ones uh, in Asia. Ockium, of course, was my experience in 1969 and 68, 1970, 71 was the main ones I did there when I was a postdoc. And 
because we now have uh, the what's now called the uh, Australian one and our one is alongside each other working as a team. And in Oxford, of course, they've got the famous Smiths Institute. You need you need commitment and experience, um, staff members ready to get involved, and new ones, and so on. You need all those obvious things uh, to make it work. Now, I just I just rehearsed some of my own experience, so you know what I'm talking about. As I've mentioned, Oxford, and they have a very good website there that you should, uh, should look at. They keep up to date lists of what's going on, and I don't know what uh, Colin will say, but I think there's a fair bit there. Um, worldwide, I've participated in these. I'm currently working on the Thailand exercise let's hope it helped we all of course remember alan taylor who was my postdoc mentor uh, he was the founder of the study groups worldwide and uh, and so on now the first one in australia was in melbourne in 1984 i was lucky to be there in new zealand that we actually hosted the joint australian one um in 2004 5 and 6 the first time it got out of australia and it, we enjoyed it so much we thought gosh only one year and five in new zealand we've got to have one every year so that's why we started mins and we started in 2015 and we've been going from strength to strength next uh the anzium one as i said uh ANZIAM was created as a joint country thing. It, it rivals Siam and culture, but is perhaps uh, unique because it's two country uh, society. Um, it, it, its overview is from Australia, the Australian Mass Society, um, but it's a separate grouping now from there, but you can join it from the Australian Mass Society. And they have the their study group from 1984, as I said, and we have ours uh, from 2015. Going well. Here's the list of um, things that we're doing here now in New Zealand, and we have the regular ones. We move every year with ours, and we go, we're a small country, only the size of Great Britain, 5 million people. I always say, counter that with 20 million sheep and a lot of uh, same number of cattle actually it's more than 20 million sheep isn't it it's more like 40 million sheep so they outnumber us farmerston north of course had one that was one of my earlier universities and uh coming near auckland we were to be in christchurch about now but of course it's postponed so we are moving it around i'll just use the uh one that i took a lot of pride in getting involved um after i'd given up being director of mins the one was held here in auckland just two years ago and i thought i'd use that as a a guide to how how they work it's modeled on the oxford system of course uh, i think many people do but we have some interesting changes i want to point out but before i put, do that i'll mention the six challenges that came that year i had done the work in getting them those countries those companies to come but look at the range of problems top left you've got uh, sanford's from the fishing industry big in new zealand of course we're lucky having a very large sea area uh, one quarter uh, the fourth biggest in the world uh, sea area around new zealand because of the number of islands that stretch up to the pacific down to the sub antarctic so we've got a lot of chance of uh, shellfish farming in this case and it's thriving they had a, an interesting logistical question this is the one i'm going to expand on further uh, from our rather unique um, um, process of taking natural gas we have a lot of natural gas we have no oil none at all so we use uh, a process that um, converts liquid gas sorry uh, natural gas into into liquid fuel because we haven't got any underground transpower that's that was a good one how can you accurately incorporate battery energy storage systems into the national grid we have one national grid of power i guess most countries do um, but we can't import power offshore because we're an island nation uh, so we have to do everything in-house and um, 
uh, using um, solar energy into the national grid was came up, but there were some very interesting electrical physics involved in, in making that happen because you've got to synchronize the frequency of the alternate currents. And uh, that's worked out well. And we have a lot of connection to countries with underground cables. In fact, so many so, being an island nation, we um, ha have a based here an international cable protection committee, which operates out of Wellington, our capital. Fisher and Pike, well, they've been good ones. Modeling the performance of a front engine, front loading washing machine. Prior to this um, innovation, this well-known company in New Zealand for manufacturing washing machines had always had top loaders. I've still got one in this house. Um, but uh, the problem they had was that during the spin cycle, they always made a wobble when it was called hunting and beating. And of course, it wasn't a good quality issue. Um, people didn't like their washing machines actually moving during the spin cycle. That's not a good thing. So they finally, after our analysis, decided that they couldn't fix it. The resonance was always in the spin cycle somewhere as it speeded up and speeded down um, uh, slow. Uh, they came up with the, the European solution that our European friends will know well. Let's have them all front loaders. And we, so we did the dynamics of a, their design of a front loader and they launched that machine five, um, two days, two years ago. That's right. And uh, it's, of course, the resonance wasn't there because you're dealing with a horizontal spin rather than a vertical spin. And our biggest company in New Zealand is Fonterra. And they, um, they uh, came again with something on flavored dairy beverages. I didn't participate in that. So that gives you an idea of the range of companies that we've been getting from a typical study group. Now, Methanex is the one I got involved with. And as I said before, it's the only manufacturer of methanol in New Zealand. And the free products facilities are in Taranaki, which you won't know the geography of New Zealand, probably it's on the west coast of this island. And it does a lot of our liquid fuel production now, 2 million tons a year. Now, that may not sound a lot for the big countries like India, but it is for a country of 5 million people. Obviously, uh, the big thing that they were worried about is optimizing the heat exchanges inspection system. And in particular, they wanted a model of the corrosion of the steel in them. The big things that you're going to see in a moment and to shut the plant down costs five or six days. And that's bad production uh, effect, bad effect on production. Um, there's an example of the heat exchangers. All, all the end of the pipes you can see are um, going right through. And it's a, it's a typical heat exchange. But of course, operating at 1800 degrees Celsius, the corrosion is en greatly enhanced. And they wanted a model to predict the rate of co corrosion without shutting the plant down. As I said before, that was costly. So there was the challenge as they stated it to us. I won't read it all out because time is short. I can see, um, and uh, they wanted a, a stochastic model, so it had to be allowed large variability, a stochastic model for the corrosion rates and predict when they should take the chance to, uh, ch to change the exchanges because they're in danger of failing. And they can't have failed, of course. They, and you can see there, some exchanges can't tolerate a single leak. That, just to give you an idea of the team that was involved in that, you can see coming from different parts of the country, um, one in one case only one Australian and one Pakistani. He was a, um, a PhD student here, um, and uh, the rest are academics seeking to, to get involved in a nice applied problem. Unlike the Oxford system, we always have our moderators uh, who have an obligation uh, to guide the week study, do a bit of preliminary work and, and, and end work. And we usually have three or four from different disciplines. In this case, um, two, two applied mathematicians, uh, Boris and myself, and a statistician, Barry McDonald, a colleague of mine. 
But we also introduced a in nice innovation of having a, a moderator as a current and postgraduate student. And they are usually very helpful because they often know the university, uh, they often come from the university in which the uh, event is being held and uh, have a lot of access to libraries and computer staff and so on. And it makes it very work very well. And, it's, and most importantly, it gives them a good learning experience. And I can think of one or two in the past groups that have actually ended up being recruited by the company that they were moderator for. There's, before I hand over to my video, have I got about five minutes left, Paul? Yep, okay, on we go. I just want to give a credit uh, early on to people that have helped a lot in the development in New Zealand, uh, Robert McKibben and March, uh, Mark McGuinness. And uh, here is the group that was the foundation meeting in 2014, I think, no, 2015, of the people from Japan, Malaysia. I think Thanel's in the audience, so he'll recognize that, myself, uh, two other J Japanese folk who instigated the meeting. This was in Canberra, this meeting. Oh, 2015, that's correct. And uh, Bob Anderson, many of you will know. I want to acknowledge the support of KiwiNet. Um, whoops, I should go back. It's obs obscuring that picture. KiwiNet, because they've done a lot of work. Actually, it's probably appropriate that uh, they obliterates me because it's me speaking at the symposium in Beijing in 2015. Uh, the Kiwi, that picture was supposed to be over there. Okay, and the Pacific Journal of Mathematics and Industry, um, lucky to be an editor of that along with many others, um, comes out of the APCFI grouping. We are hosted by ANSIAM, uh, and they have a good journal that does apply mathematics as well, applied mathematics as well. Um, and all the reports from our study groups are put in into this thing, the ANSIAM Journal of Applied Mathematics. And it has an electronic supplement that is very, very useful. Now, I'm going to move on uh, in the, my last few minutes of showing you a video that captures most of what I said. And it's got excerpts of the industry people talking, plus a few of us. And uh, it's been used around the, uh, around the region to do all these things. Student group talks, teachers, but potential challenge providers. I showed it hundreds of times doing that corporate meetings and boardrooms, and community groups like Rotary Clubs. So now what I'm going to do is just show you that movie, um, and I'll just get it up and take me a moment to shift over. Thank you. MINS is a grouping of people across the country that is trying to coordinate the activity of math and industry from experts within the country. The reason we created MIMS is that we felt that there was a need across industry and community organisations in New Zealand to have more open access to modern mathematics. New Zealand businesses and industries struggle with, with problems that they can't solve themselves, so it's important that we connect them with the mathematics community um, to, to help them become more productive, solve problems that they might have uh, in their production processes, or again to come up with completely new products. Fonterra has come to the MINS event this year um, to get different viewpoints on a problem that we've been tackling, opposed to contracting out your problem to one crowd where you'd only get their point of view. Here you've got a lot of different backgrounds from different people that you get all just in one go. And it's more of an exploratory forum where you have that interaction with somebody rather than just giving them a problem, they go away and solve it and come back to you. There's a lot more hands-on that you get to see the formulation of the solution. So Identify came to MINS essentially because we had a problem that we needed help solving. Having access to people that can help us with that problem is, is a big uh, attraction for us. Companies should come to MINS in the future because um, they, they get a lot of um, talent working on various mathematical problems and the, these problems can be solved and, and save them lots of money. 
first of all, I think students will get great exposure to what it's like to work in industry. They get to look at really real industrial problems. Um, and also they'll build connections with those firms so that when they finish their degrees, they've actually got places to go. One of the things we've got to work harder at is keeping these talented people in New Zealand. So an event like this will play a big role in that. I am really excited about research and academia in general but I think it's also good to sort out my options for the future and see if I would also enjoy some more industrial related work. So I met some great people from industry and I'm looking forward to continuing that relationship in the future. Usually as a yeah, mathematician going to a study group, I struggle to find a problem perhaps that is like, oh, this is the one that I really like and I can make a difference. And in this occasion here, it was the other way around. I, I wish I could have split myself into six and work on all of them. So at Linz, you have the two worlds. You have the mathematical world and you have the world of real applications and you get those communicating with each other. It's been absolutely a fantastic week at Linz. We've had some really good examples of where students and academics have worked with industry in some really complex problems. I've been really lucky to be working with Graham Wake and to put this together and I've seen it uh, blossom over the week and I've been fantastic and I've been really excited for the next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank Professor you, Wake. Um, uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. We have a question in the uh, in the uh, chat. Um, so, so the uh, question uh, is: um, How would you suggest to convince government and industry people in the developing countries where industries are less developed? that mathematics for society and industry works well? Right, well, that's a big challenge. I've taken it on, you know, for more years than I care to remember. Um, New Zealand, in a way, has a similar culture. We're a very outdoor in, uh, farming, um, farming area, farming country, and the impact of mathematics uh, took a while to catch track. But one of the lucky things we had is that the farming industry is one of the most scientific in the world. And uh, we're actually delighted that, that that was a big uptake area, the agricultural and forestry industries. Um, how do you convince it? Well, you get on the road. I've got myself invited to lots of boardrooms, community groups, gave lots of talks in um, rotary clubs and so on, and uh, tried to talk the language. Um, you you have about 10 failures to every success, um, but you just have to persist at it. I that, That's the short answer, Paul. I could say a lot more. Okay, well, uh, thank you. But you more or less uh, answered uh, another question that was uh, in, namely, what is the secret to, you called yourself a problem getter. Uh, yeah. So what is, the, uh, what is the secret to actually getting these uh, problems uh, for the for the study groups go and ask them what their problems are get hold of the research director in a small company much industry in new zealand is fairly small um, ask them what what are they stuck on and it won't be i can't solve this equation it will be i want to get a understanding of what's going to happen next sort of thing prediction yes yes yeah so i i mean you can't say you'll answer it but you do promise to try, you don't promise to solve. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that more or less uh, does it. So uh, I think I will uh, hand over to, um, uh, to uh, you actually, because you are, oh, yes. you are you. then moderator for the, for the coming session uh, with thank Will Skildas. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for all those who are listening. Now, Graham, you've turned it. Yes, I've just turned my mic on. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's uh, my pleasure to change roles now and introduce the next speaker, uh, Will Scheiders from uh, from Netherlands. Uh, let me just tell you a bit about him. Uh, after having obtained his PhD in numerical analysis from Trinity um, College, London, uh, Dublin, um, Will 
worked in industry for about 30 years at the starting off in Phillips Research Labs there in um, the Netherlands. In 1999, he became a part-time professor of scientific computing and industry at Eindhoven University in the Netherlands, where he, in 2010, became a full-time professor. In the same year, he set up the Dutch Platform for Mathematics, of which he is still the executive director. He'd been president of ECMI, that's the European Consortium of Maths and Industry. He's a regular visitor to the Asia Pacific Conference, um, Consortium Conference, which I have met him at, and is currently is the president of the European Maths and Industry Consortium. And I'm sure he'll explain that in his lecture. And at the international conference in Spain last year, he was uh, elected officer in large, uh, officer at large of ICAN, the international consortium. So, Will, I welcome you to be our next speaker. We are going to actually talk on. Let me just get it here. Something similar to mine, but obviously talking about the EU Maths and Industry Group um, in Europe. And that'll encompass something like um, APC. Over to you, Will. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. There was some uh, from, uh, yeah. the from the 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 ah, okay, now it's gone. So I hope everybody can hear me. And can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, okay, good. Thank you very much, Graeme, for the introduction. Um, I will talk about mathematics for industry in Europe. But first of all, I would like to thank the management of the university for organizing this very nice uh, webinar. Also, thanks to uh, Danesh and to Colin for organizing it. And uh, I would, of course, uh, love to accept the invitation of Professor Vias at the beginning. Uh, I already visited twice for study groups in Baroda and it was always a great experience. Uh, this is the uh, contents of my talk. I will not uh, go into detail here. You will see the uh, elements of my talk uh, appear when I uh, do the presentation. So I'll start with a short introduction. And as Graham already said, it's uh, good to explain what EU Maths In is about. It's a new organization. It was created in 2013 by the European Mathematical Society and the European Consortium for Mathematics and Industry. And it's an umbrella for all industrial mathematics activities in Europe. And we are a unique network. We are a network of national networks in principle. Uh, as you can see, the dark green countries are our members at the moment, the national networks that we currently have on board. And as you can see at the end of the list, there's also some uh, countries that are applying for being part of the network. So we will have over 20 countries in Europe uh, in our membership. And our will, 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 could you please turn your slides on? You haven't put the presentation on, so we can't see what you're, what oh. you're talking about. We can see you, but not slides, if you wouldn't oh, mind. Thank you. That's strange. Let's see. Um, present now. Bottom right, present now. Yes, I did that, but... Uh, and then full screen. Share. Hmm, strange that it 
it does not want to share the entire screen. Okay. Do you see it now or yeah. not? It's it's we we now see it. Thank you very much, Will. Okay, That's great. great. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, so uh, you didn't see the first few slides. Well, uh, just quickly go through it then. So this was the title slide. This is the thank you. This is a picture of Baroda. As I said, I was there twice. And this is the contents of the talk. Yeah, so the introduction, uh, so EMS and ECMI created EU Maths in end of 2013, umbrella for all of mathematics, industrial mathematics in Europe. And here is the list of countries that are on board right now. And uh, our mission is to leverage the impact of mathematics on innovations in key technologies. And we do that by enhanced communication and information exchange. Every country has its own principles and its own ways to do things, to approach industry. We already heard some uh, uh, from Graham. And it's good to learn from each other. If you want to know more, please visit our website. So there's all the information on this uh, website. Now, uh, we are in Europe, and in Europe, Brussels plays an important role. So Brussels is in the center of Europe, in a sense. And there's a large budget for research and innovation. And we try to take uh, part of the cake. And, uh, but we can only do that by a combined effort. We have to convince politicians, policymakers, funding institutions of the importance of mathematics. Many other groups have also organized themselves. For example, the Big Data Value Association or the uh, uh, Technology Platform for High Performance Computing. They also lobby for their cause. And we think it is important that the voice of mathematics is also heard in Brussels. And how can we do this? By uh, showing them success stories, by giving convincing arguments, and also by writing strategic research agendas that we are currently doing. Yeah, but uh, the PR for mathematics, the public relations, is extremely important. And uh, that's not in the genes of mathematicians. And Graham already said that in his talk, often there is a poor image of mathematicians. And we need to work on this. But we do have to do this together. It can be very successful if we do this. Uh, this is an example from the Netherlands. Recently, we wrote some reports in 2014, as you can see, also on the value of mathematics for the Dutch economy. And then in 2016, there was a big report with 20 action lines and associated price tags. And that was accepted by the ministry. Uh, and together with some other disciplines, last year, we got a lot of extra money, more than 6 million euros. And that uh, enabled us to establish 60 new positions for mathematics in the Netherlands. So entirely new positions. A similar thing happened in the UK. Uh, maybe Colin will say a little bit more about this. But uh, also there, they wrote two reports, a Deloitte report in 2012. And two years ago, Philip Bond wrote this uh, excellent report uh, with a nice title, The Era of Mathematics which it is, I think, in the 21st century. Um, and this led to extra money also for the mathematical sciences. Uh, to be more specific, 300 million points for the mathematical sciences and a doubling of the number of PhD positions funded by the EPSRC. So you see that lobbying does help. But we have to convince people of the value of mathematics. And let's spend a few words on this. So what is the role of mathematics? Well, we live in a very dynamic world. And I don't have to tell you, mathematics is really present and needed everywhere. And this is a very nice statement by one of our distinguished mathematicians. He compares mathematics to oxygen. Yeah, you take no notes of it when it's there. But if it wasn't, you'd realize you cannot do without it. And uh, so mathematics is playing a key role in computational science and engineering, for example. If you look at industry, virtual design environments are being used everywhere. Designing is really done behind the screen. And mathematical methods are indispensable, indispensable in lots of areas. For example, digital twinning and artificial intelligence. I will come back to that later. But many people don't realize 
how much of the mathematics needed to solve a problem is under the surface. They only see part of the mathematics. Yeah, you can compare it to an iceberg. And I always say that mathematics uh, gives an invisible contribution to a visible success. And I experienced that a lot when I was working within Philips research. A very nice example of such uh, the, the, the way mathematics can work in industry is this one by Volker Meermann, the current president of the European Mathematical Society. He worked on a problem from the automotive industry. Uh, the problem was disc brakes squeal. It's a frequent and annoying phenomenon. And the automotive industry has been trying for decades to reduce the squeal. But in 2015, mathematicians from Berlin made a very detailed mathematical analysis. And what they showed was there were bifurcations because the designs contained highly stiff springs. And this was really a surprise to the uh, industrial partners. So they did not know about this. And, uh, but they are now all very interested in the results. And uh, using this knowledge, they can actually improve their designs. So the mathematics really revealed that uh, some hidden properties of the underlying system. So I think this is a very nice example. But there is much more, and there are also things that people don't know. I mean, you probably all know the Moore's Law, the engine behind the electronics industry for more than 50 years. And this is really very well known. What is not so well known is that there is also a Moore's Law for mathematical methods. And I uh, summarized the results in a table here. You can see several areas of mathematics, solution of linear systems, but also mixed integer programming. And you see that the speed up of machines in this column and also the speed up of algorithms. And what you see is that the speed up of algorithms is larger than the speed up of machines. And of course, the combined effort is really stunning. And that is what it is, what enables us to do all the simulations that we are doing right now. Suppose we would have relied only on the speed up of computers, then now we would be solving the problems from the 1990s. So mathematical methods contribute significantly to speed ups, computational science and engineering. And in all cases, we see that the algorithmic speed ups outperform the hardware speed ups. But this is not general knowledge. And uh, we need to, uh, to uh, tell the policymakers. So uh, we can do this by, uh, we developed this sticker, for example, Math Insight. You will see it later as well. Uh, it's also available on our website. And it's, uh, it makes clear that, uh, that there is a lot of mathematics also inside. Some other uh, uh, aspects of the value of mathematics. I mean, there is a clear relation between the mathematical ability and country competitiveness. Yeah, so here you see the, the PISA math score in secondary schools. And here you see the global competitive, uh, competitiveness index. And you see that there is a clear correlation between the two. And this is not surprising because we think that uh, all the revolutions in computational science in big data or in analytics, they are likely to substantially increase the importance of the mathematical sciences. Uh, another aspect is also the economic value of mathematics. Uh, there have been reports in several countries. The UK started it in 2012, then the Netherlands followed in 2014, France in 2015, Spain in 2019, and Germany had a nice book in 2008 already, but they are now also thinking of performing a similar analysis, what is the value for the economy of mathematics? And uh, there are some stunning figures associated with this. I quote from the Dutch report that mathematical scientists contribute up to 26% to total employment in the Netherlands, and the economic contribution represents about 30% of Dutch national income. And if you read the report Era of Mathematics, then you will also see this uh, a calculation that the rate of return on investment as a benefit to cost ratio can be estimated for several disciplines engineering 88 for example but you see mathematics 588 so it also outperforms all the other disciplines in this respect so it is very valuable mathematics but we need to get that message across 
Now, the title of this uh, webinar is uh, about challenges and frontiers. And what I would like to uh, share with you is uh, my view on some challenges concerning mathematics for industry. And the first one is on modeling, simulation and optimization. That's our abbreviation that we use, MSO, in a data-rich environment. So nowadays, data are playing an important role, more and more important. And we think that this really provides a window of opportunity to boost innovations. So if you look at uh, the enabling technology for Europe and, and probably also for other parts of the world. So we estimated the value of MSO in Europe, uh, in the automotive industry, it's enormous, but also in other areas like aeronautics and energy, it is uh, is quite high. And you've seen the impact studies that I already presented. Now, this digital twin concept has developed really from a NASA concept to one of the hottest technical trends in 2018. So what is a digital twin? It's a digital representation of a real world entity or a system or a product. And these digital twins are linked to real world objects. The concept is not new, but uh, several factors have now converged so that we can bring the digital twin to the forefront of a disruptive trend. And this is also noticed by uh, companies like Gartner that you may know. They Every year they publish a report with uh, top strategic technology trends. This is the 2019 report. And one of the 10 challenges is the or developments is the digital twins. And I won't read all of this, but uh, you can see here, for example, this is a, a, a sky view of uh, uh, Singapore. And the company Dassault System, they created a digital twin for the entire city-state of Singapore. Yeah, and uh, it's clear that this area of business where creating a digital twin of a physical object, it might reduce spending or increase revenue potential. And that is really realized by industry. And that's also why they put a lot of emphasis on creating digital twins. And I would like to show you a movie of about two minutes. Uh, Siemens is really investing heavily in digital twinning. And the, this movie really explains it quite well. And I hope you can see it all. Colin, please tell me if, if it's uh, not... Digital good. twins. The innovation backbone of the future. Delivering virtual representations of real world products, systems and cities. For example, the digital twin of an electric motor not only showcases form, but also analyzes functions from the rotation of the shaft to thermal conductivity to data from sensors and beyond. What's more, the digital twin continuously evolves thanks to the flow of data, user experience feedback and new input, and it's greatly impacting development, production and operation. In development, a product's behavior can be simulated and tested long before a physical prototype has been built. Siemens utilized the digital twin to develop a world record-setting electric aircraft motor that not only weighs 50 kilograms, but is also five times more powerful than comparable electric motors. But it doesn't stop there. Digital twins also unleash the power of 3D printing. In a recent Siemens study for gas mixing systems, Insights from the simulation of form and flow behavior were combined with generative algorithms. The result? A truly unique channel shape and configuration, one significantly more efficient than anything previously designed. Even entire factories down to individual machines can be simulated and tested. For instance, robots. It's difficult for them to perform milling tasks because large forces in the manufacturing process lead to inaccurate movements. But with the digital twin, the forces that push the robot away from the milling path can be calculated and compensated in real time, keeping the robot in its path. When it comes to operations, digital twins made of a real point in real time the simulation of its own. The availability of the point parallel to operations can be reliably predicted, and sudden disruptions become a thing of the past. But this is just the beginning. We cannot. This is already driving the future. 
Converging digital twins with artificial intelligence allows computers to independently design advanced products. Stevens is realizing this potential right now with California startup Hackride, which aims to build customized sports cars. For development, production, and operation, the digital twin breaks with traditional paradigms and opens up extraordinary possibilities. That's why digital twins are the innovation backbone of the future. Siemens, ingenuity for life. I hope that was still visible. In my screen it wasn't, but... Uh... Digital twin technology is one of the most disruptive tools in digital transformation today. As the digital twin environment continues to grow, we look at the top 10 leading vendors. At number 10, General Electric. General Electric is a well-known name in the digital sphere. The company offers everything from digital twin assets, components... Well, is that something that you're doing? No, no, no. Is the digital twin environment will eventually reduce risk in business environments and maintenance costs, increase reliability, speed... Is that you or someone else? Production. Number nine, Cisco. Cisco is another organization driving the evolution of new digital twin opportunities. The company are particularly interested in digital twin opportunities to drive... Have you got something running in the background, Bill, or is it someone else? Cisco no, I, I have something running in the background, but I cannot stop it. Opportunities <laughs> organizations through digital twin. At number eight, the salt stands. Um, digital twins in manufacturing. The company works towards a vision of better understanding the steps can they you kill can you kill the operation down the bottom just kill the is, is youtube running at the bottom they partner with abb ability to simulate abb solution as digital twins before delivering to customers at number seven siemens yeah someone's saying there's a tab there'll be a tab in google chrome which you should be able to just close including its digital enterprise suite of integrating so in, in your yeah, but it, 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 it's not, I don't see it in my not screen that, anymore. The MindSphere platform is also complete with digital twin benefits, so businesses can better create data-driven services. Number six, Microsoft. Microsoft is delivering and empowering digital twin uh, technology. We, um, ah, okay, sorry. It looks, it looks like uh, Bill has temporarily left the meeting. We hope he, to get him back shortly. Please, uh, please wait for him. Could, could everyone please make sure they do not press present? That's uh, the the reason that Bill has had trouble is because someone pressed present and and uh, messed the system up. Please keep your uh, microphones um, uh, silent and please um, do not press present. Yeah. Okay. Microphone but... muted, please. Thank thank you, Colin. Um, we've lost Will. I understand. Um, we were doing well for a while. Um, the question I would have answered, asked, was, uh, asked him how he has managed to convince his governments and a part of the, as part of the wider European community to support maths and industry. That's a problem here in New Zealand. We've had to raise money outside of and in, make industry pay for coming to study groups and so on. And I'd love to get to the situation which... Uh, maybe some of the countries in Europe and Asia are in. Okay, I guess now I hand the um, baton over to you um, um, to oh, Colin. No, Colin. No. So, um, Colin, you're... No, you're no, the... no, no, Graham, Graham, Will is back in. So, Will, do you oh. want to go and finish? Will, will you be able to get your presentation back up? Have you got anything more to do? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, so I was not finished yet. So do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. I can see you. I can see you, Bill, but I can't see your screen. You cannot see my screen. Oh. It's very strange how this works. I mean, so I press the right buttons, I think, but... Yeah. Can, you, can you see now, it now? Yeah, now we can see again. Thank you very yeah. much, Phil. Yeah, and sorry that, uh, I mean, I don't know, it no. was running in the background. I could not stop it. So the only way was okay. to cancel the, my participation in the meeting and go again. <laughs> yeah. Start again, then. Keep, okay. keep going, then, please. Yeah. Thank you.
So the digital twins, I think, uh, will have a major impact. Yeah, so they, uh, we will make uh, modeling simulation optimization widely available, and uh, it will really uh, generate a significant amount of data, and industry is very much interested in this. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, an industry core team to help us. Um, so you see here the uh, companies that are our members, in a sense. And uh, so we work very closely with them uh, to develop this and to convince Brussels about uh, the importance of mathematics. If you go to our website, you can see some publications that we made together with these industry partners. And it's all about modeling simulation and optimization. OK, uh, I was uh, presenting this first challenge, Digital Twins. Second one is about high performance computing. And uh, yeah, I mean, everybody knows that uh, simulations need to be carried out on computers, but there have been a lot of developments. Computers were very simple so far, only one CPU, but that situation has completely changed. Um, Moore's law has come to an end. Um, <laughs> so we can only speed up by making more processors in a computer. Also GPUs used for game computers, they can be used for calculations and they are being used and also we observe that communication between processors is slow compared to the processing power of the CPUs and GPUs. So we need to develop entirely new mathematical methods. Uh, we need to develop algorithms that are inherently parallel. Uh, we need communication avoiding algorithms and also make use of the GPUs. And a dramatic example is this one. I mean, uh, we had uh, for the solution of linear systems, linear systems were growing larger and larger. Uh, we had a, a nice uh, method, conjugate gradients, published in 1952. It was not considered practical until about 1975 when preconditioning was invented and published and uh, using incomplete Cholesky decompositions by van der Voorst and Meyerink. But uh, unfortunately, this uh, preconditioning step is an inherently serial process. And if you listen to Jack Dangera, who does this uh, um, list of top 500 supercomputers, ICCG only reaches 1% or 2% of the peak performance on all top 500 supercomputers. And clearly, this is a very bad situation that we must improve. Yeah, here you see the results of a recent uh, benchmarking uh, exercise, and you see the numbers, the fraction of the peak is very low, whereas this should be 50, 60% if possible, or even more. So concerning mathematics for high performance computing, it's clear that we need to do more work on this. Uh, many numerical methods have sequential components, making them less attractive for HPC. Um, we think that HPC now is not a hype anymore, but a reality. In the 1980s, 90s, it was maybe more of a hype. Although some work was done already in that time. For example, this book was published in the 1980s, I think, uh, Numerical Linear Algebra for High Performance Computer. But nowadays, the situation has changed. It's not a hype, and we have to go to high performance computing. And here is a more recent report that uh, gives a lot of uh, background on mathematical methods to be used for exascale or high performance computing. So you can download it on the internet. Uh, the conclusion for high performance computing is that many of the methods need to be rethought. We need out of the box thinking. And mm -hmm. there are many challenges for mathematicians working with industry. You could think of combining 64 bit calculations with uh, less precise calculations or completely uh, different methods or maybe even asynchronous methods, etc. And people are also starting to discuss quantum computing, and clearly mathematicians also need to work on this. Another aspect that is a playing a role in this context is uh, that people always talk about hardware and software only. Yeah? And then software is also a mixture of mathematics and computer science. What we have done is we have introduced the word mathware to distinguish between the mathematical work and the computer science and implementation activities. Yeah, so nowadays, we use the sequence mathware, software, and hardware, rather than just software and hardware. It's not our own invention. It's a small company here in Eindhoven that, uh, that invented this term hardware, but we are uh, allowed to use their terminology. 
Okay, the final challenge is artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning. Uh, probably all of you have seen uh, publications. I mean, machine learning is really transforming our world at the moment. And uh, policymakers, uh, etc. It receives a lot of uh, research money, artificial intelligence. The people also talk about deep learning. It means that deep neural networks are being used. And uh, stunning examples are, for example, speech recognition, which is great nowadays on mobile phones. So networks usually look like this with inputs and outputs and some intermediate hidden layers and connections between all the layers. And uh, it's used mainly for image recognition so far, I think. So uh, you use many images to train a network. And if trained properly, the network can uh, do what it's supposed to do. For example, if you have a distinction between dogs and wolves. Uh, but the problem is that photos of wolves are often have snow in it. And this can lead to wrong conclusions if you make a photograph of your dog in the snow. It could be recognized as a wolf. Also, adding white noise, for example, to pictures can also lead to, there's some stunning examples about this. It can lead to entirely different conclusions. Question is also, how many layers do we need? How many neurons do we need? Can we predict this? So the bottom line is really that we do not understand why deep learning is working. So why do the networks work so well for certain applications, but why do they break down when we add white noise? What are the characteristics that, uh, on which the network makes the decisions? So sensitivity analysis. So really mathematics is needed to provide an answer here. And uh, consensus is really being reached over the past few years. The ser serious limitations, and for example, Robert Dijkgraaf, he was the president of our Dutch Academy of Sciences, now is the director of the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. He compares machine learning to alchemy and uh, accumulation, accumulation of tricks. Yeah? And he also quotes Ali Rahimi from uh, Google, who accused artificial intelligence uh, work and researchers of magical thinking. And New York Times even goes further in a recent paper, and they say that um, the new system should actually grasp three basic concepts, time, space, and causality, but today's AI systems know surprisingly little about any of these concepts. Yeah, so it's time for mathematicians to dive into this and to work on this. So that's also the conclusion for us. Um, a lot of work ahead for mathematicians in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, we may need to build entirely new networks. At Philips, we already worked on dynamic neural networks uh, to simulate the behavior of electronic circuits. And industry is very much interested in combining traditional models, for example, with AI in order to perform much more accurate simulations. And Bosch in Germany, for example, started an AI department recently. Uh, I always say we need real intelligence to make the artificial intelligence work. And I think that's uh, fully true. OK, um, that's uh, almost the end of the talk. So uh, I, I just have one slide on. Uh, some aspect that Graham was also touching on uh, in his talk. Uh, the question is, is it really interesting to work on societal and industrial challenges? And does it really need to new inventions in mathematics? Because some people claim applied mathematics is just applying existing methods. Yeah. Well, that's certainly not true. I mean, it's, uh, it's rare for an applied mathematician to receive a Fields Medal or the Abel Prize, but we are convinced that applied mathematics can be extremely rewarding and interesting. And that's why Michael Gunther and myself are publishing a new book over the summer. It's called Novel Mathematics Inspired by Industrial Challenges. And so here are some titles of, uh, of uh, contributions to this book. So uh, it, uh, it tries to prove uh, that, we, that there is certainly new mathematics coming by industrial challenges. OK, conclusion. Uh, I think first and foremost, mathematical communities should act together. We should join forces with industry, and that holds uh, especially for us in, uh, in Europe. I mean, policymakers are often more inclined to listen to industry than to scientists, but industry really makes a case for mathematics in industry. We also need to improve the PR of mathematics, tell the policymakers about all kinds of advantages of mathematics, maybe start using these Mathematics Insights stickers. And uh, specifically about digital twins, 
it will require a very major investment and a solid cooperation between mathematics and industry partners. And true digital twinning will need new ways of mathematical modeling simulation and optimization. For example, combining uh, MSO with uh, machine learning and using data. So that's it from my, uh, this is my final message. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Will. Um, I I um, wonder, wonder whether there's any questions. Um, any, are there any questions? I've got one here on the screen that I perhaps add here, Will. Um, mm -hmm. I think you touched on it actually. Um, uh, the one on the uh, oh, it's going off my screen now. I'll get it again. about the uh, use of quantum computing in the future. Do you think it's going to be with us for a long time? Sorry, is it going to be? With us with us for a long time? It... Oh, well, it, it seems that, I mean, so uh, people are very heavily investing in, in quantum computing and in, uh, produ in making quantum computers and uh, the mathematics behind it is, uh, is quite advanced. So I think uh, we yeah. should be prepared for this. I mean, uh, Yes. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I think we should also invest uh, very much in high performance computing because that is uh, with us at the moment and the yes. mathematic, uh, mathematical algorithms are really lagging behind. I mean, we don't have good algorithms for parallel machines and all our methods are uh, uh, serial in nature. Uh, so yes. we should work on this. AI is usually left to computer scientists. Is that you, you wouldn't be happy with that? Uh, no, I don't. No, absolutely not. Because I mean, from the example of the ICCG, for example, you see that the mathematicians have to provide the solutions. I mean, of course, yes. and the implementation is also uh, important. But uh, and the computer science tricks. But uh, I think first and foremost, we need the mathematics to solve the problems. You're talking to the converted in my case. Uh, I'll, <laughs> thank you very much for your talk, Will. I, I think I hand over to you now to introduce Colin. Yes, we have a nice scheme that uh, the speaker turns into a chairman uh, next. So, so yes, it's okay. my pleasure then to introduce, and thank you very much, Graham, um, okay. to uh, introduce um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Colin, please. He's uh, also organizer of this webinar. He's a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Oxford since 2013. And he has a background in mathematics and engineering. And prior to Oxford, he worked in the power engineering industry and at the University of Southampton. So he also has an industrial background. He has a particular long-standing interest in mathematics with industry study groups and has attended over 80 of these events. So maybe he's even the record holder, I don't know, but <laughs> across the whole world. Uh, he's passionate about training young, talented applied mathematicians to be able to apply their efforts to important practical questions. So Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, uh, Bill. And uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, namaste to... Uh, uh, all the uh, participants on this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm enjoying enormously the different directions that we're hearing from. And I hope that I can give a short talk about some of my experiences uh, in Oxford uh, with industrial mathematics uh, and give you some ideas on, on how those might be applicable uh, to your various uh, situations. So let me go and uh, uh, put my uh, slide up if I can. Oh, hang on. You need to, I need to share my screen. Excuse me. I'll share my entire screen. Yes. Share. And then. Can you see that, uh, Bill? I hope that's. Yes, hope yes. yes we can. Okay, lovely. Uh, that's very good. So, um, I want to talk a bit about uh, connecting with the power of mathematics. We've heard a lot about uh, mathematics, how it, how it uh, can be uh, so powerful. I want to go and talk about um, uh, uh, my experience of, of, of how that works uh, and so forth. And thank you very much to MSU Baroda for uh, making this opportunity for us to go and uh, talk about these very important uh, activities. So 
Um, I want to first talk about uh, industrial mathematics and uh, uh, why should we be uh, uh, collaborating between industry and academics? Why is that important? I want to talk crucially about the mechanisms. We've heard various uh, mechanisms talked about, but I'd like to talk about my experience of mechanisms that create long-term interactions, allow mathematicians, industry to go and benefit both uh, sides. And then at the end, what I'd like to do is just to give some interesting examples of perhaps industrial mathematics that is not uh, quite as obvious. Um, just briefly, the, uh, at the bottom here, um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to have little pictures uh, because we're all uh, uh, in uh, the lockdown here in the UK, uh, I have some pictures of uh, uh, my home institution, and this is my home institution having coffee, and coffee is the most important uh, element of all mathematical work, uh, as I will mention later. So, um, what are the uh, benefits and hurdles that I see? Well, the benefits are, as we've heard uh, by previous speakers, that mathematics really does provide a, a a framework in which you can understand really complicated problems and quite often just building that framework allows you to understand better the problem that uh, you're working with if you've built a framework you've built a model you can use that uh, model to go and in insight into what's going on in your problem what what you should do you can optimize processes you can consider uh, various uh, different scenarios and you can use those to go and gain a competitive edge over um, your uh, competitors the one one of the hurdles that i see uh, in mathematicians going and getting involved in industry is the fact that mathematicians seldom have domain specific knowledge uh, so uh, for entrance uh, uh, for example uh, if a civil engineering company comes to me and is interested in where they should position dams in order to prevent flood control i know very little about flood control or dams so i need to do a lot of discussion with them but my experience of building frameworks gives me uh, uh, and other mathematicians the ability to go and build a theoretical framework that does allow uh, such problems to be studied. Um, we've had a couple of comments on this, but let me just go and uh, emphasize them. Um, I've worked in uh, industry, uh, in the power industry, power generation, uh, and so forth. Uh, why do I think uh, industry should work with mathematicians? Well, the first one's a pragmatic one. Um, they want bright ideas on how they might solve problems uh, and so forth. They want talented students. They want talented students to go in and get jobs. So uh, if industry wants to uh, have access to those students, working with them earlier is a really good idea. The second thing is working with mathematicians rather than domain experts quite often produces novel approaches, completely new ideas on how you might think about a problem. Uh, and hence, uh, new ways of thinking about how to go and uh, uh, improve your, your, your products or so forth. So that's why industry should work with academics. Uh, why should academics work with mathematicians? Oh, sorry, this is me down the bottom. Uh, me being very baffled by a problem to do with uh, fluid dynamics in pipes. Um, wh why should academics and uh, mathematicians work with industry? Well, firstly, there are a lot of mathematicians I know who like to know, like to have their work motivated by practical problems. To know that their mathematics has an application somewhere, it goes and drives them and, and makes them interested in things. Uh, as uh, uh, Bill and Graham have both pointed out, of course, working with industry goes and provides funding for, for positions. It also provides jobs for uh, any of your students who go out and about. Several times we've heard today, and I would just emphasize it again, that one of the great things about working with industry is they go and ask questions you may never have thought of. And hence, those questions might indicate new mathematics that you need to study. And finally, by going and having industrial problems, you get um, material for uh, courses uh, that you might teach students with that are new and exciting, relevant, and inspire students in the future. So what are the three key elements that I see in going and making mathematics work uh, when going approaching companies and wanting to, to, to do activities with them? Here are the three. 
I'd say the first thing you have to do is create a theoretical framework. You've got to create a model that goes and describes the crucial mechanisms that are going on uh, within a system. That requires a huge amount of discussion, interdisciplinary work, working with lots of different people. The mathematician has to be able to understand where uh, the ideas are coming from. Once a model is, um, whoops, once a model is created, apologies, once a model is created, well, most mathematicians are, are then quite happy to think about exploring that model, val uh, um, uh, solving the model, uh, and even taking large amounts of data, go and validate and parameterize the model. That's our sort of comfort zone. But you're not finished until you've gone and actually taken the insights you gain from that model and go and turn them into ideas that industry can actually use. Again, lots of discussion needed, lots of interaction. So what mechanisms have I seen that have worked that a university could implement to try to go and uh, uh, create uh, interactions? They're going to be long term. And uh, I, I say uh, I've, I've put four, four down here, uh, short uh, workshops, uh, study groups. We've heard about them several times through here. Uh, and then the idea of having uh, uh, graduate students, postgraduate students do either master's projects or doctoral projects uh, on specific topics. So let me just go through each of those and briefly uh, outline my, uh, the, the things I think that are important. So firstly, uh, workshops. So uh, here in Oxford, we have a weekly workshop. Um, see the picture below, uh, lots of very joyous and uh, happy students uh, wanting to go and discuss that week's uh, workshop. Um, our workshops are just one hour long. People from industry come in and in one hour they present their problems. We say, please don't talk in a mathematical way, just tell us what, your, uh, what problems you have and let us discuss with you how we might attack those problems using mathematical ideas. The total effort by everyone is very small, an hour of a discussion. The benefits are enormous. It can identify individuals who want to work in those areas and you might go and create a rough idea of what mathematics you might use in order to go and solve the problem. So that's, that's uh, workshops. I see that as the sort of uh, work, um, uh, shop front. Uh, for uh, uh, a department in order to go and get companies to come in. We've heard very much about uh, study groups, uh, which uh, are, are an international uh, event. Uh, there are between 20 and 30 of them a year all around the world. Anyone wanting to get into um, industrial maths who wants experience of how uh, the interactions work, I would recommend very strongly trying to attend one of these. They're anywhere from uh, three to five days long. And here, because they're that much longer, there's an opportunity to go through the process of creating a model, trying to solve that model, trying to interpret that model. And then starting the iterative process of improving the model, improving the solution techniques, improving the inter interpolation, um, in interpretation, sorry. Um, just recently, COVID has uh, thrown its spanners in the works, as we've heard. So we've uh, now started to uh, actually run study groups virtually. Uh, they're a bit more difficult and uh, I'm not so uh, conversant with uh, all this technology, but it sort of works. I much prefer to be in person. And in fact, even with this webinar, I would much prefer to be talking to you individually, having a cup of coffee, seeing where you, uh, what your ideas are, uh, than having this very much uh, cyber cyber experience but it's the best we can do um let me just point out it, it, uh, there's a list down here of some of the exciting uh, places running study groups this year the uk we have three going on um uh india well uh, are it, it's enormously uh, beneficial for their career and um and uh and lots of really good work is done so at the moment i uh, run a center for doctoral training in the uk we have about uh, 13 to 14 students start their phd each year uh, what do we try to do well what we want to do is take extremely clever mathematicians and train them so that not only do they know more mathematics but also that they actually know how to explore a practical problem to use the mathematics which they're so good at. So they have to learn this process of developing models, 
solving models, uh, interpreting models. They're usually very good. And uh, I think the students that I'm uh, talking to out there, those of you uh, doing masters, those of you doing uh, PhDs, you're, you're doing the mathematical part is usually uh, the most uh, uh, rewarding from an intellectual point of view, but trying to go and grasp those uh, elements of creating the model and interpreting the model will go and make you so much more useful uh, to the world. So uh, our, our doctoral training center, um, uh, has two main elements. One, we're going to teach you lots of math. So we teach things about differential equations, continuum mechanics, numerical methods, optimization, data analytics, and so on and so forth across a wide range of, of mathematical techniques. But alongside, we do the things which are some called, sometimes called soft skills. I actually think they're crucial skills. What are those? They're to do with communicating. How do I communicate with someone so that I understand what they're trying to do so that I go and tease out their, the, the problem from them? What should I worry about the ethics of what I'm doing? If you're working with large data sets, what ethics am I allowed to do? How can that work? We do a lot of case studies, so students are exposed to lots of different types of problem area. We also send them out to companies and say, go out, visit this company for a while, see what it does, see what it's, ethos is, see how it works. And we also go and train them in some entrepreneurial skills in order that they can go out and set up small companies if they so desire. So these soft skills go on main, they can then use their mathematics in a much stronger way. And I recommend some sort of training like this. We do it at the doctoral level. We also have a, a, a master's which has similar elements in it. And I would suggest going down that route is a very uh, good way to go forward. So what I'd just like to now talk about is uh, um, just what do we do in our, our, our doctoral training center? Well, one of the things we have is lots of companies who are involved. So here's a, a, a list of some of the companies that we, uh, we are involved with. Um, and uh, in here, um, some, given this is such an international and diverse audience, uh, some of them you will never have heard of, um, such as Celeste down here, uh, which is three people in Wales. Um, but there are other companies that you will have heard of. Arm, the company that makes almost every single microprocessor in uh, a smartphone. Uh, you may have heard of Shot, they make glass. Uh, uh, there are other companies down here, uh, such as uh, Nestle, who make food. Um, and then uh, we have uh, uh, companies like Tesco. Tesco is, uh, at least within the UK, is probably the largest uh, shopping retailer. So having these different companies from across the, across the board of, of, um, of sectors really goes and exposes our students to a lot of different ideas, different approaches to things. So now what I'd like to do is to move on and talk about some examples of, of uh, maths with industry that I've been involved with simply to stimulate you to see what types of things uh, I see are, are, are occurring. So um, my, my first area is, is what my current research is, but my, my, my focus at the moment, and it's to do with batteries. So uh, lithium-ion batteries, the, the, the attempt to go and be able to store large amounts of energy in very small uh, regions. And we're working with some uh, companies here, Again, VBOX is a company uh, that actually works in uh, uh, Africa um, uh, doing uh, solar panels. Nexion is a very small UK company. Uh, the Faraday Institution is a UK uh, organization. But Siemens, we've already heard, and we heard uh, a very interesting um, uh, YouTube from them. Uh, the, the very large German conglomerate, very interested in going and understanding batteries. So let me do and just outline uh, the issues in batteries that people most worry about. So since almost everyone I'm talking to is sitting on there, is probably sitting on a laptop, um, somewhere in the top of the laptop will be a symbol looking like this. Uh, if you're at the one at the left-hand end, it's been nice to see you. You're about to have your uh, 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 computer turn off. Now, uh, when you buy your computer, this, the, these, uh, um, uh, these uh, symbols, as they go down, tell you how the battery discharges. But anyone who's ever owned a smartphone knows, actually, after you've owned the smartphone for a few years, once it's down to about two bars, it will die very quickly. 
So one of the major issues that people have is how do I determine the state of my battery, which of these different uh, configurations am I in, from some measurements? It's crucially important. The second thing is batteries wear out. And so Siemens has very large batteries. Here's just a, a single um, uh, box of, of, of such a thing, but quite often you'll have banks of hundreds of these. And what they're interested in is how do I extend the lifetime of the batteries inside here by operating, by charging and discharging cleverly? How can I make it last longer? Because I don't want it to be like a smartphone and give up in uh, two to three years. And then finally, if you do any work with batteries in cars, uh, this poor Tesla has blown up and caught fire. Trying to prevent, uh, trying to have safe batteries in cars is a major issue. So those are the issues that people are interested in. What mathematics are people using to go and describe them? Well, uh, here I have a, a picture of a battery. It's uh, made by rolling a number of different layers with active materials and so forth and so on uh, up. Uh, and here is uh, below it uh, um, a sort of cross section through here showing this is where you put the electricity in. It goes through the battery through here, and then this is where you take the electricity out. Uh, Colin, so somebody yeah. else seems to be presenting right now. We don't see your screen anymore. Okay. Can you? Uh, I think I have to therefore opt out and opt in again, don't I? I don't know. I mean, the, the person shared. Yeah, could, could, could Ashwini Saluke please turn their presentation off? Ashwini, please. Oh. Ashwini, we have her knitting. Oh. <laughs> uh, can, can someone in Baroda please go and throw her off the. Uh, off the um, uh, Sweeney, please uh, close your. No, can you can you throw her off? Can you just lap? Well, no, it gets very hot. It might cool. When it gets hot, it swells. When it charges, it shrinks. So on and so forth. There's mechanics going on. There's cracking. Very very complicated uh, physical problem. And you try to write down a model for this, um, and you can uh, and, and and make some some progress. So what sort of difficulties are there? Well, first, given it's so complicated, how can we go and make simplifications of the physics while still having the essence of the problem, still knowing what's going on? Um, one of the methods we, we do is a lot of uh, asymptotic methods. Uh, with uh, any people who are interested in such things, there are things to do with homogenization, uh, 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 particular techniques. Uh, and they are methods for systematically saying, I know what's happening on the very small scale, but this is so complicated, I want to know what's going to happen to the whole battery. Lots of interesting mathematical, technical mathematical details. Um, as Will talked about, once you've got this com either a complicated or simple model down, the computational challenges of solving it accurately, solving it very efficiently, as quickly as possible, and making those computations robust are crucial um in order that uh, the battery operates uh, well and then finally there are sorts of issues which are all to do with optimization which is you have a model you have lots of data from uh, some uh, uh some particular battery you're looking at i need to do parameter estimation in order to determine how well this battery is working these are really difficult questions but really interesting and things you might wish to be involved with um We've had some questions about different uh, primary industries and uh, large uh, automotive industries and how you might uh, engage with, with industries relevant to your locality, to your national uh, uh, circumstances. I just thought I would talk briefly about food, which is uh, 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 seldom studied by mathematicians, but uh, has lots of interest. So um, uh, here are some companies we work with, but let me just go and talk briefly about the problems. So the first one is uh, a company called Jakobs Dow Egbert. They make uh, coffee of various sorts. Um, here's a nice steaming cup of coffee, which I wouldn't mind having at the moment, but I will delay for a few minutes. Um, down the bottom, what do they do? They take what is called a green bean. This is a, uh, uh, a bean that's been picked and is uh, ready to, uh, to be roasted. Uh, they roast it uh, uh, at, uh, through uh, various uh, temperatures in order to turn this bean into this bean. 
So this is a green bean. This is a roasted bean. They look like the roasted beans around the coffee cup. Um, and they're interested in what goes on. So what modeling framework might you use? Well, there's lots of things to worry about. Steam and water transport, chemical reactions, flavors are generated. How are we going to mathematically describe flavor? That's heated, it's cooled, it shrinks, it, 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 it cracks. In many ways, the modeling of uh, uh, coffee beans is not dissimilar to that of um, batteries and the mathematical challenges that it, uh, that it raises. Um, I thought I would try to make something relevant to uh, a food for uh, the Indian audience. So we have a company uh, called Shark Ninja. They make blenders. And in a blender uh, in the West, we would uh, make smoothies. But of course, uh, wonderful lassies. And uh, at my time in Baroda, I enjoyed uh, many lassies um, uh, need to be made. And you want the, the finest lassies. So how do you make them? Well, we'd like to make them quickly. We'd like to make them quietly. Most blenders are very noisy. Uh, I'd like it to feel good. And the big issue that um, uh, uh, the company worries about is a thing called mouth feel. Again, something not easy to quantify. So we have to go and uh, uh, generate a mathematical model of this, go and try and solve it, and then try to improve it. So uh, here's the blender. Um, uh, to make a nice lassi, uh, I will start with a really nice yogurt down here, and then I might decide to go and put in, I like a fruit lassi, so um, maybe some mango would be uh, very nice. I throw it into the blender, I press go, and I'm interested in what happens. How can I model such a situation? Well, there's lots of things going on. There's fluid dynamics, there's uh, particles being smashed up, there all sorts of activity. So. And this is the, I noticed the only mathematics that we will see possibly today. Um, uh, we've developed a size structured model. So we're going to look at the size of each of the particles uh, in the blender and decide uh, how that size changes because particles chop due to various things. So we take a uh, mathematical model in which we worry as a function of time and as a function of particle size, what is the particle size distribution? What's the distribution of particles? And we write down a most interesting integral differential equation, uh, which I will leave for people to go and uh, study uh, later. From this, we get uh, predictions and we take the uh, predicted uh, uh, behavior on the right and we compare it with the data on the left. And if you look at this, it looks quite reasonable. However, it's the right shape, but there's lots of things that are wrong. Uh, this uh, behavior happens too quickly. Uh, there are various aspects that the company is un, uh, unhappy about in the model, but they are very happy to finally got some idea of why the shape is correct. So there's loads of iterating to do to go and improve this model. Uh, my last example uh, comes from uh, colleagues at IIT Kararapur. Uh, um, which is to do with filtering. We do a lot of problems uh, with filtering, and they're interested in filtering of uh, arsenic for water so that it's safe and arsenic isn't poisoning people. Um, uh, you filter uh, uh, the water through very large columns, uh, uh, several meters tall, uh, and the water goes through, it goes through holes uh, in, in the filter material, and as it goes through the holes in the filter material, uh, the arsenic is trapped onto the surface. There may be uh, bits of uh, material in the, in the um, water that clog up the holes. All sorts of things happen. So the mathematical framework needs to look at fluid flow, particle motion, interactions with surfaces. It needs to homogenize, to upscale. You might understand the behavior in a very small region, what happens to the entire filter. And on top of that, you've got to worry about stochastic behavior because this piece particle might go into this hole or it might go into a smaller hole and which one it does is really important. So again, really interesting uh, modeling challenges, lots of mathematical uh, new questions to be asked uh, and uh, exciting stuff to do. So let me go and summarize. Um, I think if you, uh, hopefully from what you've heard, you'll see that uh, mathematics uh, with industry and interacting with industry is a really good uh, way to benefit both the mathematicians, those of us in academia, and industry. So with either side you're on, please do get involved, please exploit the opportunities available. 
And notice there are three steps that I see. You've got to create models, you have to solve models, you have to interpret models, you have to iterate and iterate, and with any luck, those iterations will converge so that everyone benefits. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colin, for this very interesting uh, talk and all the nice problems that you presented. Also, very mouth-watering talk. I mean, when you talk about Lassie, I would really love one at the moment. Um, there's a question uh, to you. Uh, I will read it out. Does it sometimes happen that an industry partner tries to force the direction of research? And if so, how do we smoothen things out for the student involved? Um, uh, this is a really important uh, uh, question. Um, my experience is that you get a get very mixed bag of companies. Some companies will say, we're really interested in new ideas. We'll let you think freely and go on. They're wonderful to work with. We have other companies who will say, we want uh, detailed reports to, uh, every two weeks on how progress is going, and we're going to direct it very tightly. What we tend to find is that you have to have uh, senior people step in and say, this is not going to happen. And also to manage expectations early, okay? So before uh, say a master's student is to work on a project, you make sure the company is aware this student may do some work which is directly related to you, but there are no precise deliverables. I think I think avoiding looking like a consultancy firm is crucial. Otherwise, uh, there are big difficulties. Yeah, and there's another question by Kendall Bourne. Uh, Colin, would you encourage PhD students to approach companies for problems? Uh, we, uh, my experience is that uh, some some students are very good at approaching companies, and companies are really keen. Um, uh, so I would always encourage them if if those are skills they need to learn the ability to go cold calling to a company and say here I am here let me see if I can go and uh, do stuff so yeah I would yes uh, and then finally question by myself uh, I mean you talked about the weekly workshops um, do people coming over do they realize uh, that they have a mathematical problem um, we emphasize the fact that they should not come with a mathematical problem. Yes, my, yeah. my, my experience is if someone comes to you and says, I have this really difficult differential equation that I need to solve. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They're writing down the wrong problem. Yes. And what, so we really do encourage them to say, please come with your problems. Let us have a discussion to see if we can fit in, the, yeah. if, if we can develop a framework. I think that's yeah. crucial. Don't yeah, yeah. try to avoid having them prejudge you okay good thank you very much okay colin then uh, thank you very much for your talk again and uh, i think i give over to you as a chair for the next uh, session um i think no. we may then hand over to graham graham the system yeah. was working very well but we have a, 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 a yes. glitch. <laughs> right okay uh, thank you graham. Thank, thank you, Will. Um, I, it's my pleasure, without further ado, to introduce uh, Hioff, um, Paul, Paul Hioff, um, who's going to talk on uh, on the situation again back in Europe. Uh, he's actually mentioning the um, ivory tower, tower and the factory floor, floor I guess it just um, applies to us all and industrial mathematics in the digital age but, but let me first tell you a bit about Paul he's currently associate professor at the Technical University of Denmark he has a master's degree in pure mathematics from the University of Copenhagen and a PhD in mathematical physics from the University of California for the past 25 years he's been involved in application of mathematics and industry bringing study groups with industry to Denmark he is currently executive director for the European Organization for Mathematics and Industry. Paul, we invite you to address the meeting. Thank you. So I'm uh, trying to share my screen. I think I did that. Bit. Does that uh, seem to be working? Yes, it's now working, um, Paul. All right. So the, thank you. Thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me, and thanks for the uh, introduction. I think there will be a lot of redundancy 
uh, in this talk, uh, but this is the fate that you have uh, when you are all talking about uh, something very similar uh, with shared experience and you're late in the, uh, in the uh, speaker uh, line. But on the other hand, the, a good message cannot be repeated uh, too many times, uh, I think. Uh, so um, maybe hopefully I have a slightly different uh, angle on this uh, topic uh, or that. So, uh, so my aim here is to give a brief overview of uh, the activities uh, of the big industrial mathematics uh, uh, consortium or, or, or joint club for mathematics in uh, industry with particular emphasis on education and also on the subject that we all think is very uh, central to our activity, the uh, study groups with the industry. And then I have a few somewhat uh, personal observations about uh, industry academia uh, cooperation. So, so, uh, so uh, the European Consortium for Mathematics and Industry or ECMI, uh, as you can see the nice uh, logo here, which I've stolen from our website and you can see the address at the bottom. It looks a little bit forbidding, but it resolves into uh, ECMI, uh, it, IND for industry math, uh, dot, uh, org. and I invite you to check it out because it's a very lively and uh, interesting sort of blog or web page where you can see uh, what's going on. So, so, so ECMI was founded uh, back uh, in the 1980s uh, by uh, just a few member uh, universities in the UK, in the Netherlands, uh, in Germany, in uh, Italy. But it has grown uh, rapidly. So now uh, this year we are more than 100 member uh, universities uh, that are uh, sharing uh, experiences and, and I will describe the network a bit later. So it extends all the way from Portugal to Finland, all the way from uh, Ireland, uh, even to Israel, we have a uh, member and we have decided that the uh, European bit is mostly historical, that uh, we uh, are certainly willing to expand beyond the uh, geography to uh, accept members in this uh, organization. You can ask, what does it do? Well, you can look at the, uh, like all associations or, or consortiums, we have a mission statement and high on this mission statement is to educate industrial mathematicians. Uh, and it is not something that ECMI in itself does, uh, but we are a collaboration between member universities and it is these member universities who educate the industrial uh, mathematicians. And uh, also to promote, here you see, I'm repeating uh, Will Skilder's uh, call for mathematical modeling simulation and optimization and uh, in basically any activity of, of, of social and economic uh, importance uh, it could be a, a problem from the social sciences or uh, from uh, all, all manner of, uh, of important uh, activities it does not have to do necessarily with production of this uh, uh, good or, or other and then basically to uh, promote and, and ensure, and there's a huge need for that, that there's a collaboration uh, in, in industrial mathematics. And, and so like any other society that has really sprung from academia, we have scientific conferences uh, every other year. There's the uh, ECMI uh, conference and two years ago, it was in Budapest, uh, Hungary. This year, it's going to be in Limerick uh, Island, except the virus came along and had us postpone uh, this uh, meeting, which I had looked forward to enormously uh, till next year. So, uh, but, but uh, on the large scale, uh, ECMI has a biannual uh, conference. And uh, there are this publication of books. Uh, I already mentioned the very active uh, webpage. Uh, at the conferences, we give out uh, prizes for best master thesis and best uh, PhD thesis and so on. And we also have um, uh, research groups. Uh, so, so we try to seed uh, special interest groups uh, where 
people can focus uh, and collaborate uh, across uh, Europe, across uh, countries on research topics and, and uh, also on, uh, on getting funding, uh, joint funding uh, for this uh, research. And then in addition to this, there's something that makes it uh, different because I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again uh, now, uh, education uh, is uh, essential. I'm more or less picking up the baton from, from Colin here. Uh, that the emphasis, um, it's, it's, it's fun that we are so good, or think we are so good at uh, doing it, but, but uh, we really also have an obligation to uh, educate the next uh, generation. And so um, one of the uh, core uh, ideas of, of uh, this association was to uh, join, to, to help define a, a model curriculum in industrial mathematics. And uh, if a university could uh, demonstrate that uh, their education in industrial mathematics in applied mathematics met these criteria, they could become an official teaching center. And if you're an official teaching center, then your students uh, can get an ECME uh, certificate in industrial mathematics when they graduate uh, with their master's uh, degree. And this, this has actually, uh, worked as a locomotive uh, and spurred and helped uh, universities to define their curricula in, uh, in applied and, and industrial uh, mathematics. And we also do summer activities uh, for fun. So, so, um, so we have students come from uh, many uh, countries to spend one week uh, collaborating in, in small uh, groups, working on some uh, project uh, which we have typically taken uh, from a, maybe an, uh, an earlier study group, um, but uh, all based on real life applied mathematical problems. And it is often here that uh, students for the first time uh, discover the uh, benefits of collaborative uh, mathematics and also discover the universality of, of mathematics. They realize that students in other countries know how to differentiate the sign X. And uh, for some of them, it's, it's a great revelation for students to, uh, to, uh, to discover this. And, and then also it's, their first, it's the first time they really bite into uh, the modeling of an industrially based uh, problem of a real world uh, problem and have to make this balance between uh, good mathematics and, and uh, a good, um, product, a good delivery, a good answer to the uh, originally posed uh, problem. So I, I personally sent many students to these uh, summer camps and they always come home starry eyed and want to know more about industrial mathematics. And then of course, uh, there's the, uh, there's the, um, the seed that started uh, everything, I, I think, uh, the study groups with industry, these uh, week-long uh, workshops where uh, mathematicians work uh, directly with with industry uh, on mathematical challenges uh, and it, it's so important that that the industry people also take part i think this has been said a couple of times uh, but mathematicians should not be left uh, on their own and, and this and many other things we we learned uh, from the uh, from the oxford people and the uh, and uh, so my, one of my small claims to fame is that um, the, the Danish study group uh, back in 1998 was, the, I think, the first study group in the so-called European mainland, but not by much. I think uh, Holland or the Netherlands uh, came just a few months uh, later with their study group. And since then, it has taken off. So just in the uh, geographical region, there's about five, uh, eight, in good years, 10, uh, study groups per year, and uh, so so this you can if you participate in study groups, you can be very very uh, busy uh, all around uh, Europe, all around uh, the year. Um, and and the, uh, there are many types of modes that a university, and certainly my technical university can interact with, with industry. There's industrial PhDs, there's internships and, and so on. Uh, I think one of the key defining uh, things for the study groups is 
that uh, it has to take place over over one week. Um, so that gives it, uh, so it's not an hour, uh, but it's not uh, six months or a year either. Uh, it's one week. Uh, so there's a balance. You can certainly bite into the problem to a certain degree, but you also have to sometimes check your check your watch and um, and uh, figure out what are you going to tell the uh, industry. I've always said that it's, it's one of the closest things that I've found to a win-win uh, arrangement for the company. Certainly, if they if they have an issue, which should, as Colin just said, not be just to solve a differential equation, but a more general type of modeling problem, they can get it very quickly analyzed uh, by intensive work by independent uh, expert. And we often have our best master students and, and certainly some PhD students uh, along. And consequently, for the company, uh, they can make contact with uh, some very clever people who are potential uh, recruits uh, into the company. On the academic side, uh, you know, they say, if, if you're so clever, uh, why don't you show it uh, on a real world uh, problem? Uh, and you can get new ideas, uh, both for research and, and teaching. Uh, I'll come back uh, to that. And certainly also uh, your long term uh, contact with companies can be important uh, for your placement uh, of students. So, so that's the uh, connection between the um, ivory tower and, and the factory floor. And I'm exaggerating the metaphors uh, here because uh, many students, many universities uh, are not completely as highbrow as this and mathematicians do not always live in completely in ivory towers. And also factory floors do not necessarily look like this, although they can. Uh, but uh, certainly some uh, modern, uh, the digital age companies uh, can also have a nice office building uh, with lots of computer screens and that's the factory floor in, in those buildings. But the, the contact that you make, the awareness that you uh, get uh, from the ivory tower about what's going on and what are the uh, issues can actually feed back to uh, your research and, and I think many um, apparently pure uh, mathematical problems uh, originate at, at some point uh, in an industrial uh, issue. Um, and I think that's historically been true. So the one week, uh, so, so you have to get busy uh, uh, doing group work, uh, not necessarily a single uh, lecture uh, presenting because you don't have the solution. In fact, you have an elephant in the room, and um, and this elephant is the problem posed by the industry. And here's the famous parable about the blind men. So the mathematicians are the blind men trying to define what problem is that. And it's one. It's been one of the most satisfying experiences for me to see a group, sometimes a very diverse group of mathematicians, trying to get their hands around a problem. And the you know so the so the differential equation people will say well we clearly need to write down a, a PDE for this, and the optimization people will say no no it's a discrete optimization this is a discrete optimization problem, and maybe uh, if there's a graph theorist he will say no 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 you're all wrong uh, this has to do with graph theory and it can only be solved by the means of uh, graph theory. And then you get to work and then you uh, try to uh, collaborate uh, mathematically and also across uh, disciplines. And I'm have to show you now pictures. You've seen the left one already of uh, Professor Please. And this is me also at a blackboard uh, at, a, at a different uh, study group. Um, and I, I can't recommend it uh, enough because uh, it is a highly satisfactory uh, experience to work uh, in such an intensive way, uh, but also um, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in something that makes sense uh, to, the, to the real world. So, so, so let me quickly give you uh, very quickly uh, three examples. Um, 
of study group problems uh, in, in Denmark. And one of them has to do with the bearing capacity of roads. I didn't know what that was, but they said uh, if you have a wheel, if you have a, something that presses down on the road, the road will give slightly, ever so slightly. You can not make it out with the uh, naked eye, but if you can measure it, it gives away the, um, the uh, condition of the road, which is super important for road authorities uh, because when you do repair on an asphalt road you want to get to it just at the right time just at the right time of decay uh, because if you do it too early of course you're wasting your money if you do it too late the cost goes up dramatically if you get to the road when it's really deteriorating um, so so there's a great need uh, from road authorities to monitor the state of the roads and so basically to walk around all roads in the nation pressing slightly down on the surface and finding out how much does it give and the traditional methods are really slow and cumbersome but this company uh figured out uh to uh, put doppler shift lasers um lasers that measure velocities and uh when and when you install these lasers uh in a, in a vehicle you can drive along at traffic speed and you can measure the indentation of the road uh, beneath the uh, wheel well, this company needed a, a simple mechanical model uh that would be uh, complex enough so that they could it really show the conditions of the road, but simple enough so that uh, it wasn't the the message didn't get buried uh, in too many uh, parameters. And uh, Colin, you may remember this particular problem. So we uh, we cooked up a, uh, a fairly simple two-parameter model, uh, and uh, it gave away uh, very nicely what the company uh, needed. So, so if you look at the uh, bottom right, you will see the red curve is half of the indentation. The green curve is actually what you measure with the Doppler shift lasers, uh, which is the uh, derivative uh, of that uh, curve. And if you look back up at the lorry, at the uh, truck now, uh, in the upper uh, picture, you see uh, that's the curve that they are now using as the company uh, logo. And it has been an enormous success. They have sold these uh, measuring uh, vehicles, which cost half a fortune to uh, many countries uh, around the world. And these are now driving around with the study group graph uh, on the side uh, uh, of the vehicle. Another problem uh, comes from one of the really big uh, pharmaceutical companies in, in Denmark, Novo Nordisk uh, Industries, who make a big fraction of the insulin uh, to the planet. Um, and they, of course, have a big research budget, and they were interested in a very general concept, namely uh, the design of uh, molecules, uh, which could be a pharmaceutical molecule. So if you think of a cell surface and you want uh, some activity on the cell surface, you need to design a molecule which touches the cell surface in the green spots, but do not touch it uh, on the red spots. And of course, there would be many molecules uh, who um, who uh, do this. Uh, so so here are just some uh, examples of molecules uh, that do this, and they some you can synthesize uh, biochemically, some you uh, cannot. But Nova wanted to know how do you do a systematic search in what must be an enormous search base of of potential uh, molecules uh, uh, for that because um, trial and error may take uh, too long. So they wanted a directed uh, search. They wanted a basic idea about uh, how do we design, how do we draw the optimal uh, pharmacophore. And um, some of the mathematicians who won the argument about uh, what to do about uh, this um, were uh, uh, people who uh, did topology optimization and uh, and this is a you can look this uh, subject up it's usually defined for mechanical structures but you can quickly uh, modify the um, the uh, algorithms uh, to uh, deal with this problem also and it was it worked wonderfully uh, in uh, no time short uh, we could uh, provide a novo uh, and there was even some talk about making a new patent uh, about this, but in the end it was decided uh, not to. Um, 
we, so we provided them with a wonderful code, uh, which I believe they are using, and there was also a uh, publication about this. And this is an example of one area that they had not thought about. The Novo scientists, because they also employ uh, scientists, had no idea what topology optimization was. And so they were very happy to make this contact uh, with people who um, suddenly showed them a new uh, technique. And the final problem, I think a number of you may have seen uh, before, uh, comes from Lego, is another big Danish uh, company who uh, sells product uh, worldwide. Uh, um, but they were also interested in an algorithmic uh, question. So the question was, can you automate the uh, construction with Lego bricks? If you're building a very large piece, um, it doesn't work to have a human being uh, sit and try it out. And maybe you're only building it once. So why not just have a computer? Why not have an artificial intelligence? uh work out the optimal building uh instruction and there's certainly some uh constructions with lego bricks are worse than others um so so there are certain criteria for instance you must uh, you must have as many pieces overlapping as you can get away with to give sturdiness uh, to the structure you should not you should basically only build the shell of the shape there's no need uh, to fill up your shape uh, with bricks on the inside uh, because uh, they are not really used um, for, for anything. It turned out this problem was amazingly hard. Uh, it turned out to be, and I can tell you to this day, it's, it's uh, unsolved that we were able to provide them with simple shape, algorithms for simple shape shows that in some sense there are solutions, but Lego was not so interested in boxes and sheets and beams. Of course, they are interested in building spaceships and pirate ships and uh, what have you. And, and the uh, search space just grows exponentially. Uh, so there was even a, a, uh, a, a, a conjecture that uh, this was an NP hard uh, problem. Uh, it, this problem has become famous with algorithm people and there's been many even workshops dedicated entirely to this uh, problem in its complete generality as i say it's still unsolved but uh, there has been some partial solutions and lego are using these partial solutions to uh, to get uh, some ways with these uh, large constructions so these are the uh, three examples uh, and you can ask what does it have to do with the digital age well the Greenwood problem with the indentation of the road was that their lasers uh, produced an enormous amount of digital data. So you would say maybe that's a, that was an example of, a, of an early uh, big data uh, problem to be condensed by uh, modeling. The Novo problem with the pharmacophores was uh, a high dimensional optimization, maybe an artificial intelligence and the same with the Lego algorithmic uh, theory and uh, optimization. So, so all of these problems were uh, where companies um, suddenly realized they were in the digital uh, age and uh, their, uh, the basic mathematics uh, did not um, uh, suffice uh, for them. And I think Will Skildas has, always, has already mentioned that the rapid advances of digital computing supplied with uh, uh, equally uh, rapid advances in, uh, in, uh, in programming and, and modeling. Uh, I propose that we simply call this parallel uh, development Skilders law. So there's the both the Morse law and the Skilders law uh, have, have opened up amazing opportunities. Uh, you heard about uh, digital twinning and, and, uh, and factory 4.0 and, and uh, all these things, but um, it doesn't happen without the use of, of, uh, of mathematicians. Uh, the fact that all of us here are using Google, uh, we should remind ourselves that uh, the enormous company of Google was founded and started by mathematicians who uh, knew about uh, algorithms. And so mathematical techniques are everywhere. The contribution to mathematics uh, is, is often uh, overlooked, but uh, it has been documented uh, several times. It is really, really uh, significant. 
so um yeah uh they more than just uh, hardware more than just silicon uh advances require mathematical insight and mathematical uh, know-how and if you are what I have to say. That's my message. Industrial mathematics. Uh, I've told you about the European Consortium for Mathematics and Industry and uh, industrial mathematics is very much alive and, and well. And uh, the consortium with all its, its various activities, um, education and conferences and study groups continue to grow and to support education research and new forms of uh, connecting the uh, ivory tower to the factory floor. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, I'm like uh, the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. I'm checking my watch and I think uh, that's uh, uh, the end of my talk. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for a very comprehensive coverage of the situation in the ECMU MI. Um, just one comment that's coming through one or two of the chat questions is how do you get our governments in, interested in helping or do you yeah. Um, yeah. can so have you addressed if you that want to, if you want to address a government uh then uh like you say you have to go above the boardroom so you have to write uh, reports that will be read uh by by government and so uh you need to go to interest organizations that the government listens to. So, mm. so there will be industrial interest organizations. Um, yes, getting them back. Really have to, you really have to lobby hard. This is a, this is a hard uh, question. Um, yes, I mean, I'm working at it. <laughs> yes, yes, we all are, aren't we? Thank you very much, Paul. I guess we should move on. So thank you again on behalf of everyone for your talk. I can't clap. <laughs> Bye. You. I'll hand over to um, Colin, who introduces the next speaker. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Graham. What a, what a rich and varied uh, set of talks we're having uh, uh, today. Um, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Ashley uh, Hutchinson. Uh, she's a senior lecturer um, at, in the School of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. So our talks are being bookended. Uh, through the middle, we've had, a, it's like a sandwich. We have the Southern uh, Hemisphere acting as the bread, each side holding us together, and the uh, rich, rather a too rich sauce in the middle of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, <laughs> Uh, Ashley's uh, uh, main research interests are in fluid flow and elasticity, but she has lots of other interests. Um, she's uh, recently been appointed as assistant director of the Center of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Science within South Africa, which she's uh, driving forward. But um, the way I know Ashley is that she's one of the driving forces between, behind the uh, study groups in South Africa, which are really very effective. And again, uh, have to go and adjust to the local environment, to the local needs, and so forth. So I'm really looking forward to what she goes and talks about uh, in her talk, A Balance Between Solving Problems in Industry and Academic Action. Uh, over to you, Ashley. Thank you. We can see Thank you so slides. much. Okay. Thank you so much, Colin. So you can hear me and see my slides. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I also just want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk a bit about mathematics and industry in South Africa. So the title of my talk is a balance between solving problems in industry and academic excellence. I'm hoping that the reason why I've chosen this topic will become clear as I progress through the slides. So here's just a brief outline of my talk. I'll first just talk about the activities that are currently happening in South Africa with regards to maths and industry. And then I'll discuss some of the key challenges involved in organizing a maths and industry study group. I will look at this from the context of South Africa being a third world country. I'll go on to how we can address the key challenges, and then we'll look at some problems in industry 
that we have attempted to solve and continue to work on. I'll then go on to what I think is a successful example of where a balance between academic excellence and solving industry problems has been achieved. And then I'll just go on to the conclusions. So here is just a breakdown of the activities in South Africa. You will notice that there are currently only three. So at the moment, we don't have specialized programs in maths and industry. We just see activities that happen annually. The first one is the graduate modeling camp, which takes place in early January. The structure in this camp is quite similar to other study groups. Then we also have the week after the actual study group. And recently, we have been given a special session on mathematics and industry at the Sanum conference, which is held each year. Unfortunately, this year, it has been postponed due to COVID-19. Just a note on the organizers and the funders. Without the organizers and obviously the funding behind it, we would be unable to achieve really anything in industrial maths. The founder of the maths and industry in South Africa is David Mason from Wits University. The success of the MISG in South Africa is really also, a lot of it is owed to our academics from abroad that make an effort to come almost every single year. So I'm just going to name a few. We've got some from Oxford. You can see Colin here. We've also got various academics from Australia, Barcelona, Ireland. We've also had Alistair come along. Hilary Ockenden has been twice. And recently, we have another academic, Dennis, who comes from Rwanda. One of our targets is to really involve academics from the rest of Africa. So while we are as inclusive as possible, um, you know, including academics from abroad, we also really want to focus on Africa and we want to work with academics from Africa. We also have a number of local academics, Montaz, Jeff, Masut, myself, and our newest co-organizer is Eric Mabai. He is just starting his PhD, so it's very nice to have someone young and dynamic and energetic joining the team. Our funding bodies include the DSI NRF Center of Excellence, my school at Wits University, Computer Science and Applied Mathematics also assists. We've got the Herman Altava Trust and the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which is perhaps better known as Ames University. So these are the people that really make this possible. So I'm just going to talk about the graduate modeling camp. As I said, this is probably quite similar to the structure that is followed all over the globe. So this occurs one week prior to the study group. And during this week, the academics act as mentors and they propose problems to the graduate students. The students then work in small groups. It is important to note that in South Africa, we have a huge group of diverse students and academics. So often um, it, is, it can be challenging in some ways because students may come from different academic backgrounds and a balance needs to be reached. So the main purpose, as with all modeling camps, is to prepare the students for the study group. What has been really fantastic with our graduate modeling camps is that we have often gotten mentors, not just locally, but also from abroad. There are a number of overseas guests that present a problem every single year. We are extremely proud of our participants and the diversity in, in our participants. So what we do is we have one academic and two students from 12 South African universities. We also have a number of academics and students from Wits University. The focus is really on including previously disadvantaged universities. We managed to achieve this in quite a significant way this year because for the first time we hosted the MISG at a place that we have never hosted it at before. So generally, um, it was hosted sometimes at Bits University and then it alternated to Ames University. But this year, we hosted the MISC at the University of Zululand. 
So then we have the study group where we have our academics for locally and from abroad that work with the graduate students to solve the problems in industry. We invite various industries and we try and maintain a good working relationship with them. In some industries, this has been very successful, such as the sugar industry, where we get problems each year, mining, conservation, and finance. We also look at problems from Africa. They are most welcomed. Now, our problems usually involve modeling and optimization. Historically, that has always been the case. But new problems in image processing and data analysis have been introduced. There is obviously a massive shift towards using technology in solving problems. But our goal is to retain um, the, the type of modeling that needs to be done and the optimization. And we don't want to just shift over to new and modern techniques that may not enable us to understand what actually is entailed in solving a problem. So we want to have a balance between that. And I'll give an example of where we are actually going in that direction. So in the study group, we have the mini presentations, which are given almost daily, and a full presentation on the final day. Uh, after the final presentation, industry also reports back. And we do as good a job as possible so that we can encourage those industries to continue submitting problems. The work doesn't end there. Summaries and refereed proceedings are then written up. Publications are most encouraged. At the moment, we don't have a designated journal for our industry problems, but that is something that we would like to address in the future. With the SANAM, the special session, this was recently introduced, and it's quite competitive. Abstracts are submitted, and those that are the best and fit the scope will be the ones accepted. We've had some academics from abroad. Uh, last year, we had John Chapman from Oxford come to present during our session. So what I want to look at now is the key challenges in organizing a maths and industry study group. And of course, because South Africa is a third world a country, it makes sense that our challenges are going to be different to study groups that are being held in first world countries. So our challenges include power outages, lack of equipment and space to work. We do not always have a, many local academics that have expertise in maths and industry. Many of our students also lack the necessary mathematical foundation. I must though pause at this point and say, and really stress this point, that our students are incredibly talented and enthusiastic, and they really are a pleasure to work with. It's sometimes difficult to find group leaders and mentors. There's also the issue of lack of exposure, both from academics not participating in um, other maths and industry study groups held throughout the world. And we also have the issue of lack of buy-in from industries. In particular, in the finance industry, there's often protect protection of data issues. So it is sometimes very difficult to work around that. Then we also have logistical arrangements, transport and accommodation. Once or twice we've had uh, protests and that has just dislay, uh, disrupted flights or um, just led to some delays. So really what we are trying to achieve in our study group is a balance between training the students and solving the industry problems. Because our students do not always have the necessary mathematical foundation, often a lot of time is spent training the students, even during the study group. Of course, this may lead to making less progr progress on the actual problems, but at the end of the day, skills development is absolutely essential in South Africa. So we are more than happy to make that compromise. So just with facilities, what we try to do is we ensure that basic equipment and facilities such as boards, pens, overhead projectors, computers and internet are provided. Occasionally, we have had power outages, including a power outage the one time on the final day of the, of the study group. So what we did is we considered chalk and talk presentations, but very luckily the power did come back. Um, but of course, we have to be willing to adapt because these issues will come up. 
safety is not a trivial matter in South Africa. So what we always try to do is to ensure that accommodation is close to campus, so working at night is possible. Restaurants are within walking distance. And of course, many academics will be glad to hear that pubs are also often within walking distance. And of course, we keep our guests well informed. What we are doing now going forward is we're going to allow universities to make bids and to motivate as to why they should host the next maths and industry study group. Mentoring and development of students, this is really key to the maths and industry for us. A lot of the preparation is done at the modeling camp. However, this is simply a four day workshop. It is really not enough time to teach students the necessary background in so that is needed to solve industry problems. What is done during the study group is that students are included and it is ensured that they keep up. So this may mean that time is taken away from solving the actual problem and instead academics will rather sit with the students and get them up to scratch. What we also do, which may be unlike some of the European study group meetings, is that students are given the opportunity to present during the week and also at the final presentation. Many of our students do not speak English as their first language. It is difficult enough to um, communicate in terms of using academic language, but it is especially difficult for those students whose first language is not English. So we really encourage our students to practice their communication skills. Students are also encouraged to be part of the write-up of the report. Some of our more successful groups involved having two group leaders, and that was one academic and one student. And those two people would work together to produce the report. Of course, we don't limit, limit uh, the reports to those two people. Anyone can contribute. What we've seen in the past is that students sometimes take ownership of a problem and they conduct further research as part of an honors or a master's project. And this is most encouraged because at times we do not make as much progress on the actual problems as we would like during the study group. But by taking ownership, we can make more progress in the months that follow. Another issue that we have to address, we're continuing to address, is buy-in from industry. Getting industries excited and involved in maths and industry is not always easy. We have decided to make a huge shift in focus to advertising. This year during maths and, the maths and industry study group, we conducted podcasts, interviews, and even some articles have been produced. So just as an example of an article, this was, I recently wrote this, and it was in um, a journal called The Conversation. This is not aimed only at academics. This is aimed at a general audience. What we want to do is we want to get people excited about maths and industry, and not just the people, the academics, that work on the problems. We want the general public to see the value in what we do as well. We think that by doing that, there will be more buy-in and more interest in what we are doing. There are some, there's an introductory video here, which if we have time, I'll try to play later. Uh, or you can also go to our YouTube channel where you can find all these clips. There's also a clip here on one of the problems that we looked at this year, which was on bees and blossoms. I'm just going to talk a bit about the industries that we have been dealing with. What's very important is that we need to choose problems that are applicable to South Africa and Africa at large. So if we host a study group in South Africa, there is little point in solving a problem that is only applicable to, say, Europe. So we want our students to be excited about solving problems that are directly related to them and can directly affect them. The sugar industry has been very good in providing us with problems. Some of the problems we have looked at is extracting sugar crystals in a centrifuge. There's been void detection and prevention. And recently we've got a sugar crystal detection problem using image processing. Now, we don't want to 
move along and um, let mathematical modeling take a back seat to newer techniques such as image processing and data analysis. So what would really be ideal in this type of a situation is in future, when looking at uh, crystal detection using image processing, it would be very useful to also have a mathematical model that describes the evolution of these sugar crystals that will assist in the image processing um, design of the program. So that's really where we want to go. We want to be as um, inclusive of different academic backgrounds, and we also want to take a more interdisciplinary approach as we feel that really is the way going forward if we want to solve difficult problems. We've had some problems from the glass industry. We've used thin film theory to look at various problems and also preventing bubble formation, which weakens the structure of the glass. This was a very successful maths and industry, and it was in this year that the group that, work, that was working on this problem was taken to the glass factory so we could see what we were actually modeling. It was very useful. Conservation and renewable energy is also very important in South Africa. We had an interesting problem on the utility death spiral. This is a problem that is extremely applicable to South Africa, and it deals with our issues of power outages. There's also animal detection in a wildlife park, optimal design of fishing exclusion zones. I know that um, particularly New Zealand and Australia would be interested in those types of problems. Uh, coincidentally, this was actually given to us from, um, from someone from Australia, Phil Broadbridge. We've also looked at energy generation in a wind farm. Global warming is a very hot topic at the moment, and we definitely feel that it has not been receiving the attention it deserves. Now, of course, you may argue that this is not really a particular industry problem, but global warming will, at the end of the day, affect all industries. So we really do believe that far more emphasis should go into problems around global warming. So this year, we had an interesting problem on bees and flowering and the effects of a mismatch in phenology. We've looked at green roofs and also carbon capture. The goal is to really increase uh, the interest in these types of problems as well. We've looked at problems in the rest of Africa, namely the instabilities in Lake Kivu, which is a problem that came from Rwanda. I'm sure many of you know, South Africans are extremely patriotic and when it comes to our sport, we are definitely right up there with all the most enthusiastic countries. So we've looked at problems to do with swimming and the effect of lane position in a race and soccer, where different soccer balls were examined. And then it was determined which soccer ball is best to use at, let's just say, a sea level as opposed to a highland area. So I wanted to look at a successful example. Well, what I would say is a successful example that has really brought this balance between solving the problems and academic excellence together. And I will explain why I believe this problem is successful. This was the first problem that I worked at, at my very first maths and industry, um, straight out of honors. I should also say that unlike many study groups where participants had to have a PhD or at least be doing their PhD, we take students from lower levels as well. So going straight into honors, honors, masters, et cetera. So there are a number of publications, but there's no point just listing these. I'm going to explain, apart from the academic excellence, why these were so successful and why we were happy with this result. So we had a number of articles published in high quality journals, and many of these have a good number of citations. So that is one way to assess the value and the success. But what is very important, and this goes hand in hand with skills development in South Africa, is that it was both local and academics from abroad that worked together on these problems. So that was very important because there was a transference of skills, and that is really what we want to focus on. There was also a lot of student involvement. I myself was a student when I started this problem, in conjunction with uh, uh, David Mason, I supervised another honors project that was an extension of the work done here. So um, more success was obtained by not just solving this problem for industry while attempting at least making a contribution to solving it, 
we brought this back to our university and we continue to use it. In fact, this has actually been worked in to our curriculum at the honors level. We have um, a subject on mathematical modeling and we use the models that we obtained from the maths and industry study groups and we actually work this into the curriculum. So it's been very useful in terms of that. So like I said, further research and honors projects that benefit academic development in South Africa, which is just so important. Just a couple of things that I've noted over the years, some of the issues that really need to be thought out. Buy-in from industry and local institutions is absolutely essential. You need to have good people working on the problems and you need to have great problems. Obtaining the best participants and attracting them is so uh, it's much easier when you have really, really good problems. Always plan for the unexpected, load shedding, all sorts of things you never know. Um, advertise for exposure and focus on science communication. It's really important that your work is shown not just to be of academic value, but also societal value. And it must be communicated in a way that the general public can understand what you are doing and why it's useful. And of course, we always enjoy our study groups. Uh, we, we have a good time all the time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, that was uh, a, a very good uh, a talk. Can I say that was a most, uh, I feel you were, uh, you gave an incredibly honest description of uh, South African study groups. I have been to many South African study groups and can I go and say they are the most wonderful events. They're exciting, they're inspirational, a lot of work is done. There are very clever students there and I think the, the way in which you're exploiting those study groups to build, create training is really important. I also hope that by you presenting this to this very large world audience, you're identifying to people who might be sitting in countries where which aren't like the first world countries that almost everyone else has spoken from. You go and give a perception of how you can make these work and how they go and become uh, important things. Colin, um, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I show the video quickly? Do we have two minutes? Uh, go on, if you want to quickly show Are you it. Sure? Yeah. Okay, um, I will just be very quick. Is uh, Can you still see my screen? No? Uh, I, I can ask. see your screen. I can see you now. Uh, I can see. Yep. Yes. Yep. That's Perfect. But we have no sound. Oh, Actually, we yeah, have no sound. If you're not oh, in that room, doesn't help. it won't work. Right. Okay, no problem. What I'll do Sorry. is uh, I'll just leave the, the link um, in the chat and also it's on the slides. I think okay, so any, anyone, who's, anyone who's in this meeting who wants to go and see uh, the, uh, the uh, video that uh, Ashley has shown, uh, uh, would like to show, uh, please go and use that. Uh, be aware that this is all being recorded, so you can go back and look at stuff if you want. Right. Um, sorry, I'm going to have a quick look, see uh, if there's questions down here. Um, right. Um, so you talked, uh, you talked about uh, uh, getting uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, the, the difficulties of, of, of getting um, uh, people to go and lead your problems. I know I've been to your meetings. Could you just explain where do you get people to go and become mentors and so forth? How, how's, how does that work within your system? So, uh, Colin, at the moment, we don't really have a set strategy on how to do that, which is probably part of one of the, the issues. So what we ideally want is uh, for the study group, we want not just a, an academic leading it from abroad. We want them to work with the local academic. So, okay. you know, it can also lead to further skills developments and opening up different research areas. Um, I should say, which is perhaps a little bit cheeky, that it's not just the people coming from abroad that assist us. No. We also no. believe that we have skills no. that benefit people from abroad. <laughs> so, um, and, and I had one follow up question to that question that was asked, and that was, um, uh, where do you get your problems from? Some of them sound like they come from industry, but I've experienced that you sometimes use other uh, uh, 
other people within your yeah. university system to draw a problem thing. Could you just briefly t uh, talk about that? So th yes. Not a problem. Thank you, Colin. I think this will also help just clarify on, on how we try to do things. So for instance, with the mining problems, we receive a lot of those problems from our mining engineering school, which is situated within our university. So there has, there has been a difficulty in communicating with industry, but I think that is just largely to us being inexperienced on how to do that. So that's why we've shifted towards the advertising. And I've also gone to a couple of meetings where we've actually engaged with industry and going forward, we expect that even from next year, depending on what happens with COVID-19, we do expect many more industries to be participating. For instance, we really want to get the finance industry in because that is a huge sector uh, that's essential to South Africa. So we are working with different industries at the moment. Our problems on mining, uh, even conservation of energy, a lot of that has come from um, academics that have worked with industries. And I suppose that academic has acted as kind of an intermediary, um, you know, given us the problem. The sugar industry has been good because that's directly from a research institute. But Colin, we definitely have a long way to go in terms of attracting industry and, you know, getting buy-in from them which is why we're going the advertising route. Okay, fantastic, Ashley. Thank you very much for, for that excellent talk. Um, we've now come to near the end of uh, this uh, webinar. I'll start with a brief apology to say, I'm sorry if we're running a bit over time, but I feel the technical issues we've ha had to overcome have made that necessary. And I think it's in the tradition of in industrial mathematics that we, do what we have to do within the circumstances and we flex around them as necessary. Right at the beginning of this webinar, the Vice Chancellor of uh, MSU Baroda went and said, stated what he was looking for from this um, uh, webinar. And he said he wanted to know, how could you promote collaborative research, uh, connecting academia with industry? I sort of feel we have heard an enormous amount of information about that mm. and how to connect at lots of different levels, governmental level, um, so forth and so on. In particular, exploiting your local um, local situation, local skills, um, and um, and the, the the community around you. Uh, and I think hopefully you've heard from lots of different areas, and you can take many of those messages back and use them for your particular uh, circumstances. So but, uh, before we come to the closing uh, uh, of the meeting, I'd just like to go around the five, uh, well, four speakers, I won't speak for myself, the four speakers, and just ask them uh, to make a, a, a final comment from what they've been hearing, what do they see is the most important thing that people should do in order to go and get industrial mathematics going within particularly the sort of Indian, um, uh, 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 environment. So, could I turn over to uh, Graham Wake to just say a few words, if you don't mind, Graham? Thank you. Well, I guess our situation um, previously was similar to what now India is. We've the it's clearly the drive for for India is coming from the bottom. Um, I'm not sure of the attitude of the Indian government towards it. I mean, it's interesting in South Korea. The drive came from, I was very intimately involved in South Korea, like you in South Africa. Um, the drive came from uh, from the top. Uh, and it, it has perhaps been a bit biased then to becoming very academic type of mathematics. Um, you know, driven by, they use the word mathematics for industry, not mathematics in industri industry. Very important difference. And I... I've, I've kept ours with the eye in it, um, so that's that's one point. But then on, we, we're facing the fact that uh, people aren't coming into doing industrial maths uh, because there's no funding in it. And so I've tried to work on uh, our political system to try and release some funding, and that seems to be the one thing I've failed at. Um, we've had to make industry pay for coming. So whether that would happen in India, 
it, it sounds like uh, the kind of things that others are doing in other countries should work in India. You, if you've got a core of people in India that um, will get up and go, um, uh, we're lucky, I think, in New Zealand. We're a pretty informal lot, uh, and we socialize a lot, um, and uh, everyone seems to know everyone else. And so socially, a lot of the contacts develop. Maybe harder in a big country like India. I don't know. I've never been to India, unfortunately. You you should go there, Graham. The, the MSU is a fantastic place. I recommend it highly. Okay, love, thank you I'd very love much. To, love to. It's a long way to swim, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, uh, Vil, uh, could you uh, give some overview of where you think uh, those universities beginning to to work in uh, uh, mathematics in industry? Where might they be exploiting, uh, moving? What what do you think they should be doing? Um, yes, as, as I indicated in my talk, I think there are lots of exciting areas, uh, new developments where mathematicians can really make a difference. I mean, we yes. have all concluded, and I think we all know that mathematics is everywhere uh, and uh, of course we should I think we should abandon modesty a little bit more I mean mathematicians are usually very modest uh, but we can do much better on our public relations I think and really show to people what mathematics can contribute to solving all these problems that the world is facing I mean climate problems energy problems uh, and, and, and lots more and uh, yeah, I mean, I indicated some areas, machine learning, high performance computing. Uh, there's a lot to be done in mathematics. I mean, uh, it's just starting. And uh, so really, we should focus on these new areas, be there and uh, show what mathematics can do. OK, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Paul Hjort, uh, you were pushing very much on the education front. Uh, how do you see that should be done? And where, yeah. where did that go? Yeah. So, so the way, uh, so my 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 take on this is, you have to build from the ground up. So, to argue effectively with with government, you need you need success stories. Uh, you need to uh, demonstrate uh, something uh, to the to the government, and and that touches on uh, how uh, we often get. Um, uh, problems for our, for our study groups is we follow our uh, graduates. So we follow our master students uh, into their first uh, company and often invite them back to tell us how is this company doing or I get myself invited for lunch uh, with the uh, company and, and many study group uh, problems have originated with this uh, contact uh, between our graduates so and 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 the company so so um so education has a special uh, role uh, there for sure now we certainly have a, a problem that uh, the money money wise uh, in some sense there's lots of money uh, there's lots of grant money uh, for for industrially related uh, research or applied uh, yeah. research but they are typically very large grants and so mm -hmm. to to get to those you need to do something like will is uh, is uh, in instigating you need you need networks uh, and again networks are built from the ground up so um, so this contact that you have with uh, companies through your students and with colleagues at other universities through uh, study groups. This is what we are building on. Excellent. Good. Thank you very much. Lovely. Uh, Ashley, just before just before uh, you go and give just a few closing comments, could I ask you to unshare your screen? Because I've suddenly realized I'm seeing several of the participants <laughs> twice. <laughs> Sorry, Colin, I didn't realize. <laughs> so, so Apologies. Your, your, your points are very much about trying to go and use these as tra uh, use industrial mathematics as a training. But would, could you see, uh, can you say a few final remarks about where you see this going? Well, what's, I mean, our, our goal is to to become as well established as, I mean, many of the, the other study groups that are happening across the world. But we do have different challenges. And one of the main challenges is 
the training of our students that, I mean, not all of them have had the same opportunities and they come from very diverse backgrounds. So we want to be able to address those issues as well as achieving academic excellence and actually going ahead and solving industry problems. Should also say that our industry is not as well developed as a first world country. So in order to obtain good problems, that also is a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. But we are working on all these issues and we don't believe that they are disjoint. We believe that by working on all of them, it will assist in all areas. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ashley. That's uh, very kind. And um, I, I hope that the uh, uh, participants in this uh, webinar have, have really got a, an overall picture of what's going on. Can I say, I haven't ever had such an interesting discussion, an interesting lot of information, different perspectives on where industrial mathematics is. Hopefully those of you out there listening, participating in this meeting uh, uh, can see uh, why, why this is so, so important and see the passion of those involved, directions that can go uh, uh, and so forth. Um, I'd like to make a, a, just a few uh, closing remarks from as one of the organizers. I don't know if um, uh, the, the, someone from MSU Baroda might make some final remarks, but I'd like to make some first. So my first uh, thanks goes to uh, MSU Baroda's international office. They've uh, uh, organized this, made it work really well. I'm really pleased. Thank you very much for your input. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Professor Danesh is not able to unmute his microphone. So actually, he wants you to uh, wait for a few minutes. Professor Vice, I mean, Professor Parimal Vyas is joining for the concluding remarks. Oh, well, does he want to come and join us for the final comment? OK, right. It, it, uh, t tell us Danish when he's arrived. But what I might do, <laughs> what I might do is go back to our speakers and just ask them. Uh, as soon as he's uh, on, we will. Oh, well, we're going to see if he comes on. Um, Ah, okay, here's the, uh, here's, here's the vice chancellor. Is this, is this, is he coming? So oh, we're just we're just waiting for I think the vice ah we we have the vice chancellor thank you. Yeah. Hello, Scott. Namaste. 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 Uh, uh, I uh, once again I I have joined you because I had a couple of other uh, visitors and the administrative assignments but then uh, it was so nice of you I, I I once again I thought that I would be with you for a couple of minutes and uh, uh, let me uh, appreciate your support once again i hope uh, all of you had wonderful time uh, professor graham uh, so, uh, so nice of you professor paul uh, professor colin and dr ashley and uh, professor will that was that was uh, that was indeed great uh, for the maharaja sahaja university of baroda and uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, this is a very nice beginning. We all should thank COVID-19. It has brought all of us together and now we have a very nice platform. And uh, we are looking forward for collaborations. I, I believe the challenge before all of us is to inspire young ignited minds, you know, who come here in the universities to realize their dream. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm so happy today because all my departments uh, of Faculty of Science and Faculty of Technology and Engineering, they're all together, they all have joined hands. I think that gives me a lot of strength. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, you know, uh, initiative that I would like to share with all of you, we have set up what we call it as Institute of Interdisciplinary Research and Studies. In fact, what I've been observing is that there is a lot of compartmentalization is happening. Beginning the challenge that we face, let me be very honest, I'm a professor of management. The challenge that we face is that we want to really 
nurture a culture in our research staff, the young ones, we need to tell them that these are the good quality journals in Scopus or Web of Science where they really need to contribute. Sometimes they do good quality work, but then it is being published in those journals for which they really don't get recognition. So I, I think uh, um, um, apart from this discipline, I invite all of you together or whenever it is convenient, Professor Dhanesh would act as a coordinator. We would like to have many such interactions exclusively even for research scholars because then if you spend about an hour or so, I, I believe that would bring a change in their entire approach in carrying out research publications. And I, I believe the, those mistakes probably which we have made in our life, I really do not want our young scholars to face those difficulties. So it was truly, uh, uh, you know, a very, very pleasant experience for me uh, to be with all of you. And uh, uh, I uh, uh, also convey to each one of you that you also please take care, please stay safe and please stay in home. And I believe uh, time is the only solution. And what we in India, what we are experiencing here, now we have already started from the survival to we are in the revival stage and now we are moving towards from revival to the growth stage i'm very happy to share with you today the honorable prime minister has talked about uh, you know five i he talked about intent he talked about inclusion he talked about investment he talked about infrastructure but above all the most important i which i also uh, crucial uh, you know important that is the i of innovation we will have to um, Relearn, unlearn, and learn. I think it's a continuous process, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you all uh, provided your your support, your shared your experiences with the attendees, and I am looking forward for many such occasions, either virtually or maybe, as I said, you are most welcome, and we would be more than happy to host anyone or all of you as per your convenience. May God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful time. And uh, uh, please take care of, please take very good care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vyas, uh, Vice Chancellor. Just before we finish, I, just before I make one last uh, comment to those of you who've listened through this entire talk. Um, there is one person who has not come on to speak during this meeting who has been uh, critical in making the work uh, happen. He has sat quietly in the background. He is the one who is inspired and have the vision to create this webinar. Uh, he will probably not say anything, but I feel I should say something for him. Uh, it's Professor Dr. Danesh Patel at MSU Baroda. Uh, he's an inspiration. Gather around him and use him as an example to, to go and move this subject forward. I've really enjoyed today and I thank everyone uh, at Baroda who's gone and made this uh, a meeting so, 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 so uh, good, who've made, the, got over the technical issues and we really appreciate what you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from Nepal. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. 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 Namaste.